Welcome to the Tuesday, May 18th, 2021 regular meeting of the Walnut Creek City Council. This meeting is being held in accordance with the Brown Act as currently in effect under the State Emergency Services Act, the Governor's Emergency Declaration related to COVID-19, and the Gov Governor's Executive Order N2920 issued on March 17th, 2020 that allows attendance by members of the City Council, City staff, and the public to participate and conduct the meeting by video conference. Video conference locations are not open to the public. As some attendees may be participating in their first Walnut Creek City Council meeting or their first teleconference meeting, I wanted to welcome everyone and talk briefly about the public comment process. For each agenda item, there will be an opportunity for public comment on that item. Thus, if you desire to speak on an item on the agenda this evening, please hold your comments until the council considers that item. Additionally, we have a section on the agenda titled Public Communications, which is for public comments for items not on the agenda. Any comments during the public communication should not relate to an item that is on the agenda this evening. Consistent with section 9.5 of the City Council Handbook, 30 minutes will be initially allocated for public communications for items not on the agenda. Additional time for public com communications for items not on the agenda will be provided at the end of the meeting if necessary. This process is consistent with section 9.5 of the City Council Handbook adopted July 15, 2014 and amended on September 3rd, 2019 and will allow for all public comments to be received during the meeting for items not on the agenda. When I open the public comment period, use the raised hand feature or press star nine if you're connected by audio only, which will alert staff that you have a public comment you would like to provide. We ask that everyone who wishes to speak to an item, please use the raised hand feature to state your intent to speak when the item is called. Please wait your turn and once brought into the meeting, state your name and your city of residence for the record. Please keep in mind this is a city business meeting. The city council has adopted rules of decorum to ensure that meetings are conducted efficiently and effectively and that all members of the public have a full, fair and equal opportunity to be heard. All remarks should be addressed to the city council. Please do not use profanity during your comments. As the council is conducting these meetings via video conference and given the COVID-19 pandemic and the increased number of speakers that have wanted to make comments on various issues during our meetings and consistent with city policies related to public comments, each speaker will have two minutes to make your remarks. The Zoom feed for each speaker will cut off automatically at two minutes. The council will accept oral comments. Written comments submitted have been and will be posted to the city's website for public review and are included in the meeting record, but will not separately be read into the record. To, to provide a live remote public comment, join the Zoom video conference meeting. The meeting ID is 955-0267-0010. The passcode is 653475. Should you choose to not provide comments but would like to view the meeting, you may do so in one of the following ways. YouTube Live, you can visit the City of Walnut Creek's YouTube channel. Cable Broadcast, Comcast Channel 28 in the incorporated Walnut Creek area only. Rossmore Channel 26, Wave Channel 29, and AT&T U-verse Channel 99. And you can live stream it online on the city's website. At this time, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Would the city clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Darling? Here. Councilmember Haskew? Here. Councilmember Silva? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Francois? Here. And Mayor Wilk? Here. All right. Before we get to our first agenda item, I wanted to say that with the release of the DA report, this past week has been a poignant one for Walnut Creek. Our community has suffered together through the loss of Miles Hall, and we can't even uh, imagine to know how especially painful the last two years have been for the family and friends who grieve the loss of Miles each day. This will continue to be an emotional issue, and I believe this is a reflection of a community that cares deeply about Miles, about our fellow community members, and about our pub public safety professionals. While we may all never agree on every aspect of this tragedy, I think we can agree on one important fact. Much more work must be done to meet our society's mental health care crisis, and we must do whatever we can locally to provide immediate help for those who need it most. We are committed to preventing this type of tragedy from occurring again in Walnut Creek, 
and we are making significant improvements to our mental health reporting and response programs. In addition, we're working to give our police officers more training, tools, and better options when confronting a situation when they've been called. This is all a work in progress. Each step forward takes us farther along the path toward better helping those in a crisis. It is my hope that we continue on this journey together to move forward in a positive direction in making our community as safe as possible for everyone. Now, next on the agenda is the consent calendar. Does any council member wish to pull any item for discussion? And um, does any member, oh, let me first ask that. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just gonna say that I um, on advice of council because one of the items on the consent calendar impacts my property, I'm gonna recuse myself and I'm staying from voting. Okay, council member Darley. And which, which item is that specifically? The um, construction, the okay. cement contract. Okay. Yeah. Uh, item 2B. 2B. All right, thank you. Does any member of the public wish to comment on an item on the consent calendar? Please use the raised hand feature or press star nine if you're connected by audio only. If you'd like to make a public comment. For those who desire to public comment uh, on a consent calendar item, please raise your hand now. As a reminder, each speaker will have two minutes to make their oral remarks. The Zoom feed for each speaker will cut off automatically at two minutes. Written comments submitted have been and will be posted to the city's website for public review and are included in the meeting record, but will not be separately read into the record. At this time, I'll ask the city clerk if there are any members of the public who would like to provide comments. Mayor, I don't see any um, hands raised for public comment on the consent calendar. Okay, thank you. So seeing no speakers for the consent calendar items, I'll ask the city council if anyone would like to make a motion with regard to the consent calendar. And as noted, council member Darling will be recusing herself from item B. I, I move that we accept con consent calendar items um, A and 2A and 2B. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, let's take these one at a time, actually, since we do have a recusal. So let's first on, uh, on 2A, let's have a roll call. Council Member Haskew. Aye. Council Member Silva. Aye. Council Member Darling. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Francois. Aye. And Mayor Will. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. And now let's get the roll call, if we could, on item 2B. 2B. Um, Councilmember Haskew. Aye. Councilmember Silva. Aye. Councilmember Darling. Recusing. Mayor Pro Tem Francois. Aye. And Mayor Wilk. Aye. Motion carries with Councilmember Darling recusing herself from 2B. Okay, thank you. All right, next we do have public communications. This portion of the meeting is reserved for comments on items not on the agenda. Under the Brown Act, the council cannot act on items raised during public communications, but may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed, request clarification, or refer the item to staff. Consistent with section 9.5 of the city council handbook, 30 minutes will be allocated at this time for public communications for items not on the agenda. Specifically speaking, that is the budget. Additional time for public communications for items not on the agenda will be provided at the end of the meeting if necessary. So just again, as a reminder, any budget related comments that have to do with the budget at all should wait until the budget agenda item. So if any member of the public wishes to provide public comments at this time, please use the raised hand feature. If you're connected by audio only, press star nine. For those who desire to provide public comment on an item not on the agenda, please raise your hand now so that we can identify the total number of speakers that desire to speak at this time. As a reminder, each speaker will have two minutes to make their oral remarks. The Zoom feed for each speaker will cut off automatically at two minutes. Written comments submitted have been posted to the city's website for public review and are included in the meeting record, but will not separately be read into the record. At this time, I will note that the time is 6.11 and we will take public comments and items not on the agenda until approximately 641. And then the remainder of any such comments at the end of the meeting. City Clerk, are there any members of the public who would like to provide comment? Yes, we do have members of the public wanting to provide general public comment. We will go ahead and bring in Pete Bennett first. Okay.
Go ahead. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yes. Look at all those heads nod. You remember me? I'm Pete Bennett. I was a resident of Walnut Creek. I had a business in Walnut Creek. I had offices right next to City Hall. I had offices up on Broadway. I had offices on Oakland Boulevard, twice. I had a cabinet shop in Fairfield. I had a cabinet shop in Pittsburgh. And I once had a computer store on Third Avenue. You know, it's been a long journey. I can clock off 40 years of things that have happened. 40, cars towed, excessive tickets, false arrest. So a few months ago, a former resident of Walnut Creek went through the divorce mill. He was found murdered in Martinez. November. He used to sleep on the street here in Martinez. We tried to help him. Like I used to sleep in front of Toyota and Walnut Creek. They didn't arrest me. It was a very nice, safe spot. We complete with cockroaches on occasion. When I try to file claims, I meet obstacles beyond belief. I was going to sue the city, but they killed my attorney last summer. And the guy that was just murdered in the gazebo used to sleep with Will, who was killed. And I've asked for help for years, years. I begged the FBI for witness protection. It worked out fine. I lost five of my nephews in Utah. Two seconds, that's all I got left. Next speaker is Allison Ennick. Hi. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and city council members. I'm here with my classmates, Zach, Ellie, Levy, and Emily, and we're all seniors at Northgate High School who also participate in College Now, which is a college dual enrollment program located at DVC that student takes courses in both high school and college, and it's offered to juniors and seniors in MDUSD. In our economics class, we are completing a senior capstone in which we analyzed Walnut Creek City goals and budget to identify a spot that needed improvement, which we are presenting to you all today as a Hammer Baker plan. We will be commenting on the old budget. This plan is named after the civil rights activists Fannie Lou Hamer and Ella Baker. Fannie Lou Hamer became the SNCC field secretary in Mississippi and founded the Mississippi Freedom Par Democratic Party. Ella Baker was a secretary for the NAACP and SCLC, Southern Christian Leadership Conference. She also helped students like us found SNCC and eventually became their chief advisor. Both Hamer and Baker fought for change in their local communities by empowering young people to get involved and we hope to carry on that legacy. After reading through Walnut Creek City budget, we have indeed identified an issue we would like to discuss today. Afterwards, we hope to focus on creating equity in the city of Walnut Creek through the implementation of explicitly anti-racist policies. We, all, we are also here in honor of Miles Hall and in support of the Justice for Miles Hall Foundation. We also want to share our disappointment with the complete lack of justice in District Attorney Becton's investigation. An independent investigation is absolutely necessary. Miles Hall should still be alive today and our project is in honor of him. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. And as noted, these, uh, just for the record, these students will be talking, will be speaking on the last budget and not the current one. And so they will be speaking under public communications because it is the last budget item or the last budget they'll be talking to. So let's bring in the next student, Su uh, Susie. Sure, Levi Goldstein.
Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can, Levi. All right. Uh, hi, my name is Levy Goldstein, and I'm here with, I'm also here with the College Now program for our senior capstone project. Uh, like my classmate Allison said, our task was to review the city budget, identify a program or policy that did not align with the city's goals, research organizations that were working towards those goals, and present a plan to modify what we identified to better fit the city's economic goals. Research. Um, my group members and I have spent time reading and analyzing the city budget, and in our analysis, we found that the city values predictability and fiscal security. This was demonstrated by policies and commitments like the policy that allocates one-time revenues and surplus to support one-time expenses. In addition, we saw the largest source of revenue was arts and recreation, with 31% of revenue from public works, 22% from community and economic development, and 4% from the police department, along with a few other assorted incomes. In terms of spending, 30% of expenses or $52.1 million was spent on police, 26% on public works and 21% on art, arts and recreation. Based on our analysis, Walnut Creek seems to prioritize economic stability and economic growth. This is evident by the money spent on community development and other actions taken to create business and shopping areas. This can be seen in the development of city arts and recreation programs that bring in revenue such as the Boundary Oaks Golf Course. Our greatest concern with the city budget provided to the public was the lack of detail, especially in regards to the city's biggest spender, the police. Thanks for listening. My classmate will continue. Thank you, Levy. Next speaker is Emily Lambert. Is my audio working? Hi, Emily. Yes, it is. Awesome. Um, so as my classmates have said, while analyzing the city's budget, we became concerned with how unspecific some parts are. Um, for example, Section 885 of the 1122 program allows local law enforcement to purchase equipment through the federal government to use as emergency response equipment. Um, this includes things like military-grade tactical gear and weapons and more, which are all outlined in the 1122 program equipment and supplies catalog. The budget for the Walnut Creek Police Department does not refer to this program or supplies purchased through it in any way, shape, or form. We see this lack of specification in budget detailing as a brick on the wall standing between law enforcement and Walnut Creek inhabitants, um, preventing the desired relationship the city is striving for between the two. It becomes harder to trust law enforcement when no specific information is known about the tactical weapons being purchased from the federal government with our citizens' own tax money. We're concerned too because this lack of transparency in our budgets uh, also makes irresponsible spending and excessive use of the equipment, services, or other purchased goods much easier. Theoretically, if an officer is given access to a lethal weapon, they will only use it if absolutely necessary. Um, but in reality, that access makes it easier for that officer to make poor decisions that could result in injury. Over the past year, the world has watched tensions between police and trust protesters clash time and time again, um, distancing us farther and further from a trusting and peaceful relationship. Um, this is happening through tragic events like the murder of Miles Hall. The first step on our path back together is complete honesty, especially in the form of a much more detailed police fiscal budget in years to come, which will be talked about more in the following parts of our presentation. Thank you. Thank you Emily. Next speaker is Ellie Rasmussen. Hi, is my audio okay? Yes, it is, Ellie. All right, thank you. Uh, my classmates, Emily and Levy, have talked about the budget and the problem we identified. Through research, we have found multiple groups and organizations that service Walnut Creek that address some of these issues. Rise Up Against Racism is an organization founded by three Walnut Creek mothers. They have small, free, anti-racist libraries scattered around the East Bay, which have a collection of anti-racist and diverse books for residents of any age. It gives them the opportunity to read the stories of others and evaluate the parts of their lives and communities that need change. This initiative explicitly combats systemic racism by promoting education and representation for groups that are too frequently diminished in the media. The Trinity Center is an organization that serves homeless adults and the working poor in Walnut Creek and Central Contra Costa County. 
They provide necessary services like meals and hygiene amenities, as well as referral service, services, mental health support groups, and more. While the Trinity Center is not explicitly anti-racist, Black people are both 13% of the national population and 40% of the homeless population. Therefore, serving marginalized communities like the homeless is also serving a large population of Black, Indigenous, and other people of color to help them find housing and relieve them of food insecurity. Finally, the Justice for Miles Hall Foundation advocates for change regarding police response to mental health issues by proposing the Miles Hall Lifeline Act, AB 988, with Rebecca Bauer Kayan. Not having police act as mental health professionals benefits both the police and the city. This non-police response to mental health crisis would be named in honor of Miles Hall and is a step towards the justice not given after the investigation's conclusion. The fact that police officers involved in the shooting are still employed with the department is disheartening. Police violence disproportionately affects people of color and has ended too many lives and too often gone unpunished. The work these organizations are doing is instrumental in the fight against white supremacy in Walnut Creek and beyond. However, more accountability is essential and there's still more that needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. Next speaker is Zachary Robertson. Good afternoon, can you hear me well? Yes, we can, Zachary. Great, uh, as my classmates have demonstrated, the lack of transparency in the Walnut Creek police budget is a problem that affects social well-being and economic prosperity. This issue needs to be addressed and I'm here to offer a solution. We ask that along with a budget, the city of Walnut Creek release a document available to the public specifically listing all police equipment purchases, especially military equipment, and political expenditures. We also suggest that the line items in the annual published budget be specified. This will help the city because a lack of transparency in the Walnut Creek budget document creates distrust between the city and its citizens. Even if the police department is not spending the money on military equipment or political lobbying, the citizens of Walnut Creek don't have that information. Many feel afraid of having military weapons on the street. On the other hand, knowing exactly what the Walnut Creek Police Department owns and what the department is spending money on will help build trust between the citizens of Walnut Creek and the people who protect them. Transparency will also create an environment of public accountability where the department is held responsible for all purchases and use of said purchases by the citizens of Walnut Creek. This will help prevent unnecessary use of force and injury in the field. Additionally, if the city releases these specific documents each year, people are more likely to spend time in Walnut Creek and thus participate in the economy and invite others to as well if the environment feels safe and welcoming. Uh, requiring further budget transparency will result in economic growth in the city and allow the economy to prosper. If needed, we can also work with the Justice for Miles Hall Foundation to ensure that these requirements are being met and to hold the city and police department accountable for all purchases made. Uh, thank you very much for your time and considering implementing our plan uh, for change in the city of Walnut Creek. Thank you, Zachary. Next speaker is user BG. Hello, um, my name is Barbara Guinness and I've um, been a resident of Walnut Creek since 1996. I recently attended the mayor's chair standing committee special meeting on April 23rd. And I was allowed to speak um, regarding the plan South Lime Ridge by Flow Trail. Uh, at that time, I expressed a concern, a, a personal safety concern about uh, people that are on foot or horse, you know, equestrians or people on horses at the junction of the Timberleaf Trail where the proposed uh, bikes are supposed to be flowing down, which would be at a higher speed than, of course, walking or running down the flow trail. Um, it was mentioned in the meeting that I'd be contacted by somebody that I believe was a pros uh, chairperson uh regarding this concern and i'm not sure when that would happen but i just want to let you know i haven't heard from anybody yet and i think you do have my email uh if you want my phone number i can give you that you know at some point too uh second item i wanted to talk about was um the source of the funding for the southern lime ridge uh, bike flow trail i've attended a couple meetings where you know it was talked about you know how much money would be spent here and there but i couldn't quite tell uh, 
you know, it's not specific enough on what would be spent for the um, bike flow trail. And of course, can't ask questions. So I couldn't um, determine, you know, or ask the question where the money was coming from. I, I did speak with someone that said, and not from, um, you know, your department, but uh, that said donations and grants are some or all of the source. So I would like to know um, if you could advise on the percent of the monies that might be coming from mountain bike companies, distributors, uh, sto bike stores, bike riding groups, or any other organizations that are affiliated with the biking industry uh, in this community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker is Patty Mitchell. Hi. Can okay. you hear me? Okay, great. Um, hi, um, I am Patty Mitchell. I'm a resident of Walnut Creek, a homeowner and a business owner. And the reason I'm speaking tonight is I want to call out two really disturbing examples of the Walnut Creek Police Department being out of sync with the stated values of city leadership and displaying outright contempt for the public. And I think they need these, these examples need to be addressed to find out if, um, if they're true and, um, and why they um, were left to stand. The first example is written comment by an anonymous police officer who claimed to be on the force and representing other officers currently on the force. It was in um, the pub written public comments at the last city council meeting. It was a frightening window into at least some of the PD's attitude toward people who are, they are supposed to protect and serve, as well as contemptuous attitude toward city leadership. These comments made me and many others who read them feel afraid for our own safety. I'm honestly afraid to be calling them out here, but leaving them here to stand unchallenged seems more dangerous. I think someone, someone who's supposed to hold the police accountable should look into, um, into what the claims made as well as who felt it was um, appropriate to make those claims. The second example came from comments now deleted from the city's Facebook page from a retired member of the PD leadership who attacked members of the public and expressed an insider view of the PD's attitude toward the public and the PD's attitude toward the diversity initiatives and toward public safety and accountability and systematic change addressing, um, addressing public safety. Um, I would also, uh, and, and they're very disturbing comments um, and they were left up to stand. I'd also like to know what the city's policy is with regard to social media posts, what posts get um, comments uh, closed and what posts allow comments to stand and when they delete and why they delete. Next speaker is Tan Hall. Hi, hi. Sorry, I guess you can't see my video. Um, hello. Uh, it's been a while since I've uh, been on here. And um, as Kevin, I know, thank you for acknowledging the DA's report. I think it's important um, for the city um, to have that acknowledgement um, and for the work now that we are working together on um, to make sure that we have better mental health opportunities, alternatives for our community members. Uh, unfortunately, Miles wasn't, didn't have those opportunities. And, you know, even after us calling the day before and no resources were, were offered. So I'm really happy to hear that the importance that the city council feels this is. Um, it's almost been two years since Miles has been gone. And um, of course, we are not satisfied with the district attorney's response, um, the ruling, and we are also escalating this to the attorney general. Um, but I did want to let everyone know um, that work that we are doing 
in Miles' behalf is powerful. It is in his name. Um, some of the great things we've done is backpack giveaways in the winter for homeless. We had for his birthday, we had a bike giveaway for foster youth. So we are officially a 501c3. We're a non, we're a Miles Hall Foundation. And we, all the work we do is for in Miles's memory and also to honor and protect that's part of our mission statement is to create change, protect families, to ensure that this tragedy like this doesn't happen again. Because it happened here in Walnut Creek, it can happen anywhere. And I, I think for a lot of our community members, people who, who don't understand mental illness, that's our education. That's the work that our foundation is now working so hard to do. So I appreciate your partnership and look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Do we have any more speakers? Mayor, I don't see any additional hands raised for comment. Uh, okay, so we'll close public comment for the night. And I do want to make mention, as was noted this evening during public comment, there was considerable, considerable dialogue stemming from a social media post that we shared on the police departments and city Facebook pages after the release of the district attorney's report. While many of the comments were respectful, several exchanges between members of the public uh, in replies to the post became extremely personal and far off topic. I wanna make one thing clear. Former employees of the police department or the city who post on these pages do not speak for the city of Walnut Creek. Social media can be a valuable outlet to express opinions on issues of the day. And in this, time of heightened emotions, I would ask that all commenters on our public channels be respectful of each other and not devolve into personal attacks. That only serves to divide our community. Issues that need to be addressed by the city will be done so during city council meetings and official city announcements and not in the comment section of social media posts. And I'd like to ask our city attorney to explain how we moderated comments. And so, thank Steve. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. The city uses several social media platforms to engage with the public and our, and our police department and arts and recreation department have their own Facebook pages in addition to the citywide one. These are intended to be a place to share information with the community and the city has a social media policy to guide their use in response to one of the comments from one of the speakers this evening. The policy enables us to support free speech by our residents and followers in this limited public forum while moderating or removing content that is threatening, libelous, or defamatory. Several comments were in fact removed from the police department's Facebook page this weekend because they violated the policy and that policy will continue to be enforced. You can view the city's social media policy on the city's website at walnutcreek.org. The city and the police department do not condone the post and replies that were moved, nor do they represent the city or the police department's policies, practice, or values as mentioned earlier by the mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, city, Mr. City Attorney. And um, I'd like to also pass this over to our city manager, Dan Buckshide, to provide some context to our city changes around mental health responses that was brought up during public comment uh, as well as by Ton Hall at the end. Uh, sure, Dan, <clears throat> excuse me, Dan Buckshy, city manager. And uh, just to, before I dive into that, I just wanted to share a couple comments relative to budget process in response to public comment this evening in terms of purchases <clears throat> for additional exploration if anyone's interested. So in terms of process and, and supporting transparency, uh, most every purchase that is over $85,000 uh, is publicly noticed and placed on the city council agenda, and that would include uh, those purchases for the police department. The few exceptions are for public contracting in terms of major construction projects. Uh, the threshold is a bit higher, but that really would not apply to PD equipment purchases. So those types of purchases are going to um, the city council for full approval in a public forum. Anything under 85,000, which is smaller, uh, can be approved by me or by the department head, depending upon the dollar amount. Additionally, although it's, admittedly, it's not the easiest document to read, uh, I believe it's every other meeting effectively once a month. 
we post what are called our warrants, which is a printout of every single purchase that is made by the city, uh, regardless of the dollar amount. So that is some additional documentation. I would encourage folks to, to look at if they're interested in doing so. Uh, shifting gears in terms And before you of, go on, could I ask you one more question that came up under that item? It was sure. a reference to money we money that is spent for political campaigning, and I believe that is illegal, but could you please comment on that as well? <laughs> yeah, I can, and if our city attorney wants to opine as well, but yes, uh, taxpayer funds or any city funds cannot be used for political campaign purchases. There are very stringent campaign guidelines and uh, very severe ramifications for doing so. So the political process in terms of active campaigning is intentionally kept separate from city government operations. Anything else on uh, budget before I move on from anyone else? Okay, so in terms of the efforts um, that have been underway, you know, I do want to um, acknowledge uh, the comments from Tom Hall, uh, appreciate the sentiments of moving forward. I believe we all share that sentiment of how can we partner to move forward on these initiatives in a, in a real meaningful way to, to make some difference. Uh, for those that uh, may be attending for the first time this evening in terms of what we've been doing for the past two years, there are several efforts that are underway. The most notable is a 24 uh, seven, an effort, let me back up, an effort that we're working on jointly with Contra Costa County and our 18 neighboring cities to implement a 24 seven non-law enforcement response to mental health crises and considerable activity has been underway and uh, want to give our, uh, at the time, uh, Mayor Laura Haskew and our full city council some credit for pushing this along with, this, with the county uh, last summer, uh, almost a year ago now, a little less than that, uh, probably eight, nine months. We had begun efforts prior to the pandemic. They were stalled with the pandemic, unfortunately. And then Walnut Creek drove it forward with the county by bringing it to the mayor's conference and pushing the effort forward on a, on a regional level because we really need the county's partnership as they are primary providers of mental health care. And as we know, these types of crises don't stop at city borders. So there is a major effort underway with uh, all the partners I noted to develop such a program. The intention is later this summer uh, an enhanced program for a 24-7 non-law enforcement uh, response will be up and running. There are various additional components related to this. One is the um, a, a number that other than 911 that can be called uh, for those in a mental health crisis. Uh, that number is currently proposed to be 988 uh, related to national standards and statewide. So our county and this team that's working on this effort is uh, pursuing that crisis hotline. And then what the bigger challenge beyond just a dedicated line is, is what happens when somebody calls that number? How is the call triage? Where is it routed? Uh, what sources? Uh, not only is it a 911 or 988 call, there's 211. There are other not-for-profit providers that also provide referrals. So how to coordinate all that to make sure that we have a, a methodical and thoughtful and um, and similar approach, consistent approach across all 20 different governmental entities within the county that are working on this. Additionally, uh, beyond those efforts is to create additional services and facilities for those who need mental health treatment uh, after a crisis has occurred. So right now, individuals, when, a, when somebody is what's called 5150 or taken into, uh, whether it's by law enforcement or by medical providers to psychiatric evaluation services at the county, they can only remain there for up to 72 hours. And then they have to either be released into their own care to their families, or in some cases are transferred to another facility for a longer term stay. But there aren't many options. And so there's an effort right now, a facility, a building has been identified in the city of Concord. And we are pursuing federal funds through the stimulus funding collectively amongst all 18 cities, 19 cities in the county to find funding to get that up and running. That's a little longer term. It's going to take more time. The goal is to get the call in line as well as the 24-7 the response going later this summer uh, and no later than early fall. So stay tuned. A major effort is, is con continues to be underway on that front. A few other things that the city has done uh, has invested heavily and additional response options, uh, non-lethal response options for our police, including uh, beanbag 
uh, guns, bola wraps, uh, and new tasers, upgraded all of our tasers. And we also upgraded our body-worn cameras. So it's higher quality cameras that are uh, also have additional mechanisms for when they turn on, in addition to just having to do it yourself uh, and having an officer tap the, uh, the camera. It's also done if they withdraw their gun or their taser from their holster. It's also turned on automatically if a police car turns on its sirens. And it's also turned on if, uh, um, if a, an officer who's in a certain geographic proximity turns on their body-worn camera for whatever reason, another officer's camera will turn on or those that are in the nearby area. So again, that's all intended to help with de-escalation and, and to help with transparency. On a somewhat uh, related but slightly different front, um, we have major efforts for just mental health training for our employees, not only our PD, additional training for mental health response, but we're also planning to train some of our employees who encounter those with, with mental health issues and, and other avenues and some of our other programs. And we are also looking to enhance training related to diversity, equity, inclusion, and implicit bias. And we those contracts are nearly finalized and we anticipate the training for DEI and, and implicit bias to occur later this summer. And the mental health training of our officers was, the additional training was already completed about six months ago. And then just last week, there was additional crisis intervention training that was being provided to all of our officers. So that's a, there are several other items that are underway, but uh, I don't wanna take up too much time this evening. I think that uh, should provide a sense of the major activities that are underway. Thank you, City Manager Buckshy, for that update. Um, lot, there is a lot going on. Um, I do want to ask if there's any other council members who have comments or questions of staff related to anything in public communications that came out. I know Council Member Silva already asked one question. Do you have another one? I do. It's related to um, Barbara. I was going to say Guinness. I didn't quite hear her um, last name um, clearly. So she had some questions about the funding, the proposed funding of the proposed um, flow trail. And is there someone that can get back in touch with her? Because I think there might have been some confusion at the previous meeting that a pros commissioner would get in touch with her, which doesn't seem the most uh, likely path to get her questions answered. Right. If somebody from the pros staff uh, could contact her, that would be helpful. And if just in case we don't have uh, your information, Barbara, if you would, e if you don't have the um, city clerk's email, you can send your email information with your contact information to mayor at walnut-creek.org with your request to be contacted by somebody from our park recreation open space staff. She also contacted us. It was in the mail ahead okay. of time. Yep. All right. Okay, uh, seeing that we don't have any other questions as it relates to public comments, we'll now move on to council member and staff announcements, reports on activities or requests. Uh, so let's first ask if there were closed session announcements. Mayor, there were no closed session announcements. The council did not hold a closed session today. Okay, city manager reports. I do not have an update this evening, Mayor. And then city council member reports on AB1234 activities, council member assignments and various activities and upcoming events. So let's start with council member Haskew. You're on mute. I went the wrong way. I'm gonna beat everybody um, on my report because it's short and I even have some fun, to th fun things to talk about. Um, our finance committee met um, Mayor Pro Tem and I and the city treasurer are the um, elected officials that are part of this committee and you're going to hear most of it tonight. I'm not going to repeat or prepeat anything that happens. I attended the Contra Costa Transportation uh, Planning Committee meeting and we authorized uh, Fair Pierce to develop the BMT mitigation program framework and we authorized CCTA to take on an administration for the transportation network company uh, regarding access for uh, the disabled. Um, several of us attended the mayor's conference and I'll leave that for somebody else. 
Uh, several of us participated in the league's legislative activities uh, where we presented our case, learned about our case, and presented our case for legislation and budget activities with the state. Um, I attended TransPAC. We reviewed the executive director. Uh, we approved the budget and our work plan for the coming year. And here's the fun part. Um, 511 Contra Costa um, made their report and there are some fun things coming up. There's a summer bike challenge. Uh, there was a winter walk challenge. Uh, we still have an e-bike rebate program and there are 13 slots open for Walnut Creek. Um, that means $150 rebate to somebody who is about to buy. And they're looking into encouraging um, secure bike storage so that it will be easier to convince people um, because one of the most concerning items about riding a bicycle is what you do when you get to your destination and how do you keep your bike safe from being stolen or attacked. So uh, there we are. And so, there, oh, there are two school uh, street smarts assemblies, um, one on both in Park Mead, one on 924 and one on October 6th. So 511 is a fun, fun spot to check. 511 and Contra Costa, I think .com or .gov or .org. I should have looked it up. I think it's .org, but thank okay. you, Council Member. Thank you, Council Member Haskew. Uh, let's go to Mayor Pro Tem Francois. Thank you, Mayor. It is indeed 511contracosta.org. I'm perusing the e-bike rebate somewhat as we speak. <laughs> but I also attended the Finance Committee meeting with my colleague, uh, Council Member Haskew. And, and as she reported, there'll be fuller discussion on that item later tonight. I didn't attend any other meetings. Tomorrow, I will be attending the meeting with the mayor and the Mount Diablo Unified School District. So I'm looking forward to that as a member of the Council Edu Public Education Committee. And then a brief report on Ross Moore and the Golden Rain Foundation. I wanted to congratulate Dwight Walker, who will serve as the new president of the board and welcome uh, new board members, Ted Bentley, Paul Mataraki, and Leanne Hamaji. That's my report. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, let's go to Council Member Darling. Okay. Um, after the last meeting where we passed our CBDG budget, uh, the next day was the Homeless Task Force meeting. And um, they got the, heard from the staff that the, we were looking to fund the full core team for two years and they immediately um, set about trying to figure out how to use it to tackle some of their homeless um, challenges, particularly um, people that need assistance on the weekend. So that was, they were deeply appreciative of our support of the core team for the next couple of years. And the other really fun thing I got to do was um, Wednesday night, I met with the Youth Leadership Commission and we had a, a interesting discussion. I just love talking to them and hear, hearing their perspectives on things. And it was really quite a bit of fun. So that's it for my report. All right, Council Member Silva. I'm looking for fun things to do. Um, <laughs> today, in that spirit, I attended a webinar sponsored by the League of California Cities. It was on, uh, it was a round table actually, with more than 200 participants, including a member of our staff from Walnut Creek on opening city halls. And there were ideas and comments from all over the state, everything from temperature checks of the public waiting to speak during council meetings to uh, requirements for masks. Is anybody considering making reservations? I thought the most salient point in our discussions on how we might open city council meetings was really around the requirements of the Brown Act and we will have to adhere to that. And I do know that the governor is looking at his emergency orders how they impacted the Brown Act and what will be, happen going forward because that we have to keep in mind. There is another webinar on the same topic tomorrow at noon that the um, Cal Cities is sponsoring. It's for mayors and council members. So it might be even more relevant to what we do and what we're thinking about. As my colleagues mentioned, um, both last week and actually continuing this week, 
council members from all over the state are meeting with legislators talking about issues that we are particularly passionate about, that bills that are coming before the state um, assembly and the state senate. I have been in meetings with um, Senator Glazer, Assemblymember Grayson, Assemblymember Bauer Cahan, as were um, Councilmember Haskew and the mayor. But I also participated in meetings with um, Senator Wachowski and Senator Quirk, and they're on the, um, or Assemblymember Quirk, sorry. I thought there were a couple that I'm hoping that we have as a city sent letters of either support or oppose in the organics arena, SB 619 will give us a little bit of breathing room in terms of meeting the requirements of a previous piece of legislation rela related to not only the processing and collection of organics, but the processing and redistribution of processed or food waste and food recovery. It is not, SB 619 does not delay the implementation of the bill. What it does is delay for one year the impact of penalties on cities because during COVID cities across the state had a lot of layoffs, et cetera, and just didn't have the wherewithal to begin to implement all of these requirements. So I hope we can take a support position on SB 619. Also in the broadband arena, two bills that are parallel or companion bills, AB 14 and SB 4, which relate to broadband and funding for broadband recurring and um, funding for broadband. And um, I would mention also SB 278. I'm sure our HR department and our finance department is very aware. This is a bill that if adopted would require, would basically would put the onus for all responsibility on disallowed pension agreements or be pension benefits on the cities, the school districts and the counties, as opposed to on CalPERS sharing responsibility for things that CalPERS approved and then changes its mind on. So it, an, an oppose letter on SB 278 would, would be very helpful. The, um, at its recent quarterly meeting, the East Bay Regional Communication System Authority adopted its next year's budget. There were no increases in the cost, the annual cost per radio for the public safety radios, um, but we did adopt a resolution that is going to our cities in the two counties asking each city to be aware that we need to, in our land use decisions and our findings, make the applicant of a development responsible for any impacts the development would have on the public safety radio system. And this is relevant both to entities or cities in which you're doing greenfield development at the outs outer edges, such as one um, housing complex that is being built above San Ramon, but it also is relevant when we're um, increasing density downtown and we're getting more height, we could actually be impacting the um, capacity and the effectiveness of the public safety radio system. So our staff needs to be aware of that. And I did attend the Chamber's homeless web uh, panel that it had last week. It had some interesting data and some interesting um, information that was presented. And I'm really proud that as a city, we are continuing to invest in services and infrastructure to support those challenges. And Mayor, thank you very much for the, giving me some time. All right, thank you, Councilmember Silva. Uh, my updates are, well, uh, the first time in a year, I was able to actually have a ride along with a police officer. Uh, get a lot of good insight how they're really helping the homeless, as well as how quickly they're able to respond when needed. Uh, it's something that I tried to do every six months prior to the pandemic, and I think it's important to continue to get uh, a, a look into how the police operate within there, and it was a, a really good ride along. I want to really thank uh, Corporal Silva for uh, allowing me the opportunity to ask a lot of questions for several hours. Uh, in addition to what Councilmember Silva and uh, Councilmember Haskew had mentioned, we had legislative meetings with our state representatives. So we've been advocating for Walnut Creek, uh, what we support, what we oppose, and uh, along with all of our regional partner positions. And we did have the mayor's conference uh, that we attended. They, we had a presentation for the library with the county librarian telling us what some of the plans are in a, uh, as we get to a post pandemic world and, and how this will work for our libraries and some of the differences and changes and, and some of the hours that 
that we'll be discussing actually in the budget uh, on one of our next agenda items. I did have a public art dedication that I went to at our newest condo development at the top of Trinity Avenue. And I bring this up, not just because it was a public art, uh, which, is, which is nice to have in Walnut Creek always, but it was great to see people outside and dedicating openings again. It was the first time I've done that in over a year. And I know that uh, former mayors Haskew and, uh, and Silva certainly can appreciate what it's like to be in person versus uh, how, um, how frustrating it can be over Zoom when we don't get to actually see the people in person. So uh, that was great to be able to do that in person. Again, I look forward to more coming up uh, in the near future. And I do want to mention uh, and finish by mentioning that the Heroes Among Us nomination period for April and May is now open through May 31st. You can nominate someone that you feel has gone above and beyond and helped make Walnut Creek the special place that it is. We hope that sharing these stories will brighten your day and also shine a light on acts of kindness that sometimes don't get the recognition that they deserve. So go to walnut-creek.org, it's on the homepage, and uh, nominate somebody that you think has really helped make Walnut Creek a brighter place. Uh, and it doesn't just have to be that they made it a brighter place over the last two months. It can be that they've done this over the last six or eight months and you just haven't had that opportunity to mention it yet. So please do that. And we'll be able to announce who those nominees are and the recipients at one of our June meetings. And I see council member Haskew's hand raised. Yes, um, both, both of them, my blue one and my regular one. The, um, I'm, since you all are gonna be talking to the Mount Diablo School District people tomorrow, um, TransPAC is uh, focusing on schools and buses and uh, congestion at schools. Would you please um, emphasize that we're looking to help them solve the problems and that they've got a reputation of being very difficult to get, to get responses from. So any additional lobbying to get them to pay attention to helping get their help, um, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Good information. Yes, Mayor Pro Tem Francois. Thank you, Mayor. I, I just want to respond to Council Member Silva in terms of the legislation. Um, the mayor has already signed letters in support of the two broadband bills and opposing SB 278. I think we had a watch position on 619 because that was the league's position, but we have another meeting this Thursday where I expect we may update our position to support. And what and just for, the, for the public, uh, Matt, if you could just say what uh, yes. 619 is because they may not have all of this memorized. I apologize for speaking in code. Uh, so SB 619 was the a relief measure to allow for a phased implementation of new organics recycling legislation to give cities around the state a little more breathing room and time to implement the new laws, which are really requiring it's a good law, but it, it will require rethinking how we currently do business to implement. So the, our, our particular agency is, is poised and ready to go almost, but other agencies around the state need a little more time. So if I could augment, one of the issues is that the people who will pay for these additional organics processing requirements and procurement requirements and food recovery will be ratepayers, the residential and businesses with the garbage bins. And so that will get passed along across the state through all our various agencies. And so one of the points to be made in that is really that that's, this is not the time to be um, increasing the costs for those who are just now starting to recover from loss of jobs. All right, thank you. And I believe that wraps up all of our uh, council member reports. So next on the agenda, is a consideration item for fiscal year 2021 third quarter budget update. So this is just for the past quarter. We'll be discussing on the next item, the upcoming budget. So this is a purely a report that uh, can be provided by staff now. Good evening, Kirsten LaCasse, Administrative Services Director. Katie Bruner, our budget manager, is gonna provide you with a presentation on the third quarter report. Thank you, Kirsten. Okay. 
Good evening, Mayor Wilk and city council members. Uh, can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay. Perfect. So I am Katie Bruner, the budget manager, and I will be providing the fiscal year 21 third quarter budget update this evening. So this evening we will review, um, I will review what's changed since budget adoption, provide an update on the general fund, parking fund, and Boundary Oak Golf Course Fund budgets, and discuss the American Recovery Plan Act, also known as ARPA stimulus funds and recommended uses for 21. And this evening we are requesting that city council authorize the use of up to $4 million in ARPA funds in fiscal year 21, which I will discuss in further detail. So last year, the following assumptions guided the development of our fiscal year 21 budget. We assumed in-person school would begin in the fall of 21, that there would be no additional state or federal support, no major uh, COVID-19 medical breakthrough, and a prolonged economic recession from, from uh, the recession that began in fiscal year 20. As of the end of March, uh, most students have the option of attending school um, in a in-person model. The third federal stimulus package ARPA was enacted on March 11th, which provides funding directly to cities and local governments. And there are now three COVID vaccines available and Contra Costa County specifically has reached its, uh, has provided 1 million vaccine doses before their revised goal of um, by Memorial Day. And with regards to state and county health order restrictions, Contra Costa County has been in the orange tier since April and the state has set a date of June 15th for reopening. So in the general fund at the end of the third quarter, the general fund has better than anticipated sales tax revenue and projected expenditure savings. And based on the third quarter results, we are no longer anticipating the use of reserves to balance fiscal year 21 and are projecting a contribution to fund balance. So the general fund revenues um, at the end of March were 68, 64% of budget, excuse me, and expenditures are 68% of budget. And based upon these results, um, we're projecting about $2 million more in revenue than budgeted, and then projecting about $3 million in expenditure savings. And this results in a projected contribution to fund balance of about 2.8 million at fiscal year end. So to look at our projected increases in revenue, um, the fiscal year 21 budget assumed a revenue loss of about $12 million. Well, um, and while the third quarter projections are better than budgeted, our revenues are still about $10.7 million lower than our pre-COVID um, actual revenues when we compare to fiscal year 19. So as of March, um, 31st, the city has received sales tax revenue for transactions occurring within the first seven months of the fiscal year 21. Um, so in other words, we've received sales tax revenue for sales occurring between June or July 1st, 2020 through January 31st, 2021. Forecast from the city sales tax consultant, which is based upon our actual tail set sales tax receipts from the October through December 2020 quarter, project our total sales tax revenues will be 26.1 million by the end of the fiscal year. Um, and as a, a side note, our sales tax receipts for the January through March quarter will be available um, late May, early June of 21. So the better than projected sales tax revenue will offset projected decreases in transient occupancy tax interest revenue and department revenues. Our transient occupancy tax is projected lower than at the second quarter due to lingering impacts on the travel industry. Non-essential travel was restricted in California well into January of 2021. And overall, our TOT revenue is projected to be about $760,000 lower than budget. Our interest revenues are projected lower due to historically low interest rates. And with regards to department revenues, 
Community development projected lower revenues at the end of the second quarter due to the timing of projects which will most likely occur in fiscal year 22. Arts and recreation revenues are projected lower due to the continued closure of the Lesher Center and the use of Tice Valley Gym as a COVID vaccine site. Um, staff will be pursuing FEMA reimbursement for the lost revenue of the Tice, at the Tice Valley Gym. And then additionally for the Lesher Center, the December 2020 federal COVID relief package included grants for shuttered entertainment venues. So the Arts and Recreation Department has submitted an application and is awaiting a decision. So overall at the end, of, based on the third quarter results on general fund expenditures, um, about $3.1 million in expenditure savings are projected. These are savings are projected due to vacancies, the county and state and county health order restrictions and shuttered city facilities. So the parking fund is still experiencing greater revenue loss than budgeted and staff are still projecting a deficit in fiscal year 21 for this fund. Overall, a $2.6 million deficit is projected at the end of the fiscal year. Revenue is projected to be approximately $4 million lower than budgeted. Um, and this does include, the projection includes revenues from the purple poles, which just began charging this week. Cost savings are projected to be about $1 million. And this, these have been achieved through holding positions vacant and restricting purchases to essential expenditures only. At the end of the second quarter, at the second quarter budget update, staff recommended using CARES Act funding and fund balance to offset the projected parking fund deficit. Staff are recommending to use ARPA stimulus funds to close the parking deficit in fiscal year 21 in an amount ranging from two to two and a half million dollars in addition to the CARES Act funds. And this will result in no use of parking fund reserves, fund balance, or general fund support to close the parking fund deficit. And Boundary Oak, excuse me, Boundary Oak Golf Course continues to see records demand for growth for golf. And at the close of the third quarter, revenues are 78% of budget, expenditures are at 69% of budget, and the fund is projected to have revenues and expenditures within budget at year end. The American Recovery Plan Act was signed on March 11th and provides one-time funds directly to local municipalities. Um, the goals of ARPA are to stabilize government, economic recovery, and uplifting communities. Uh, based on recently released revised allocations from the De Treasury Department, Walnut Creek will receive $8.3 million in two installments. The first $4.16 million will be received by June 30th, 2021. And the second $4.16 million will be received a year later by June 30th, 2022. ARPA funds are allowed to be used for revenue loss from the COVID-19 pandemic, investments in water, sewer, or broadband infrastructure, responding to the COVID-19 emergency, including addressing any economic effects and providing premium pay to essential employees. ARPA funds cannot be used for pension costs or tax cuts. And staff are, we are awaiting further guidance from the tre Treasury Department as the final rules are developed. So in fiscal year 21, the use, excuse me, staff is recommending to use up to $4 million of ARPA monies, including up to two and a half million dollars to close the parking fund deficit, a million dollars for the restaurant grant program, which was authorized by city council on December 15th, 2020, and then up to $500,000 for rebound program costs. So in conclusion, the general fund is projecting increased revenue compared to budget, as well as projected expenditure savings due to vacancies and continued COVID impacts on operations. The use of reserves is no longer anticipated in order to balance fiscal year 21. And based on our third quarter results, an estimated $2.8 million is projected to be con contrib contributed to fund balance. 
while overall our results for fiscal year 21 are projected to be better than anticipated, our total general fund revenues are still significantly lower than our pre-COVID revenues. The parking fund continues to see revenue loss, which is resulting in a projected deficit of about 2.6 million. With the use of CARES Act and ARPA monies, the deficit can be closed with no use of reserves, fund balance, or general fund support. Boundary Oak Golf Course continues to see record demand for golf. Expanding operations is allowed by the state and county and is projected to end the year within budget. And finally, the city will receive $8.3 million of one-time stimulus monies over the next two years. The use of up to $4 million of ARPA funds is recommended in fiscal year 21. So this evening, we're asking city council to receive the report and to authorize the use of up to $4 million in ARPA funds in fiscal year 21 for the parking fund deficit, the restaurant grant program, and the rebound, pro rebound program. Thank you, Katie. That concludes the presentation and staff is available for questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, wow. I don't think anybody would have expected this a year ago. Uh, let's go to any questions by the council. Council Member Darling. And thank you guys for all the hard work on this. I bottles the mind how closely you've balanced the books and really done a great job at pulling it through. And Kirsten spent about an hour answering all my questions the other day as I was trying to learn how to do a city budget. So I really appreciated that. Um, so I just wanted to make sure um, for the unassigned balance in the general fund, right now we're looking at about 2.8 million estimated at the end of the year. If we use the ARPA funds that would to cover the restaurant program and to cover the um, um, rebound program, that unassigned balance is expected to be higher than the 2.8. Is that correct? That's that's correct. The restaurant grant program was was funded from our fiscal year 20 unassigned fund balance. So the that funding would then be restored to that. Um, that bucket for lack of, of better terms, but the 2.8 um, for the rebound program costs would, would project it to be increased if the ARPA was used. But then on the parking program, um, we weren't pulling ahead and we weren't showing an unassigned balance. And so the use of the ARPA money will just make that one balance and um, we'll be good. We won't have to do anything else. Correct. All right, thanks. Council Member Silva. Can't tell through the glare if my microphone is on or off. Thank you very much, Mayor. And thank you, Kirsten and Katie for your presentation and all of your work and the, all of the work of the finance and administration departments on this. I know this has been a very challenging, we'll say 13 months, 14 months. And um, no one would have expected that we would have come out the other side of this in, in as good a shape as my colleague said. But I will remind everyone that there were significant budget cuts and furloughs and layoffs that allowed us to balance the budget. Otherwise, we would be in a significant, continue to be in a significant world of hurt. Um, I did send a question earlier. I think, Katie, you actually answered my question, which was how did we um, calculate the sales tax revenues? So what really amounts to is the 16 million that's in the third quarter results is reflective of only seven months worth of collections. And so there's still another five months of collections, which is why there's an additional 10 million that could, could be coming in. And continuing on with um, Council Member Darling's question, the unassigned fund balance, that will not be actually affirmed until the completion of the certified audit in December, correct? And then we, per our policy, we will consider how to utilize those funds in January or February of 2022, is that correct? Correct. Um, I have two questions and I actually need some other staff members for these questions. They're related to things that we may have um, had to set aside a year ago when we were adopting this budget. The first is related to the parking fund, but I, I'm hoping Carla Hansen is in is on the meeting and can come in and answer my question. I did 
send her the question in advance. And the second person is um, city engineer, Steve Waymire. I am here. I'm not quite sure why my video is not working. Apologies. Oh, you're behind the curtain. You're the Wizard of Oz tonight. I, I wish I was. I'm sorry about that. Carla, thank you very much for being here. I sent you my question earlier, but it's really to try to once and for all answer the question now that we're coming close to the end of this budget year. What capital projects that the parking fund would have paid for did we, I've decided to use the word scuttle. So it's clear that these are one uh, capital projects that we might have invested in that we were not able to do either at the end of last budget year or this budget year. Can you tell us if there's anything? Uh, sure. So at the end of fiscal year 20, the council did defer two projects out of the parking fund that we had planned to do in fiscal year 20 and we deferred because of of the pandemic and the um, the projected deficit that we were looking at in um, the parking fund. So those two projects were the EV charging stations and the Locust Street redesign project. When we were putting together the fiscal year 21 budget, uh, the two recommended projects to go forward were the EV charging uh, project and the Lesher Center garage elevator rehabilitation project. Um, those two projects have been completed or are almost near completion um, in this fiscal year. So um, really the deferred project is the Locust Street Redesign Streetscape Project, which is um, programmed in the 10-year uh, capital improvement program, I believe in fiscal year 26 or eight, 26, 27 uh, fiscal year. And can you remind me how much that project the total project cost estimate is about uh, $5 million. This is a, a huge overhaul of the Locust Street uh, streetscape. And the parking fund was um, going to be allocating about $150,000 to that project. To do, the, design, to do the, the initial design work. Correct. All right, thank, thank you. And so now that rather than do it, the Locust Street redesign project, rather than having completed it already, we have now pushed it out. Steve Weimeyer is looking, yeah, where is he going? He's going to get his document. The, um, um, it has been pushed out for about six or seven years. Is that right? The redesign work? That's true. There's no funding right now for it. So it's set up in the CIP and the, and the capital budget we're bringing to you doesn't have any funding for it at this point. At this point, okay. So then, um, Steve, I had the same question I called you earlier today and asked you when you looked back at the end of 2019, 20, and then what this current budget was, road work, capital work that we were unable to do either because of the reduction in gas tax receipts or the underfunding of the capital budget by the general fund this past year. Yeah, so there's two phases of that. Let's, let's talk about the gas tax first. And there's actually two phases because going into COVID, we already had a budget set up in the 2019 capital budget for um, gas tax. And we started to see revenues were starting to drop. And so the first project that we dropped out of there was to um, prepare the medians along Ignacio Valley Road for the overlay from uh, Civic Drive over to um, San Carlos. And we decided to not do that work and just leave the uh, medians as they are. So we're not gonna be able to come back and do that. So it was a once in 20 years opportunity, but we decided that we are uh, better to spend the money on the overlay than actually try and take care of the median. So those medians will stay the same. And then going forward in the 21 budget, we also recognize there would be less um, gas tax also because people were driving less. And so we made a decision to defer residential overlay and, and uh, slurry sale work and really focus in on our um, arterial streets. And what that means is our residential roads will get less work on them. And um, City of Walnut Creek is pretty good about not having complaints about our residential streets. And so as we keep deferring it, um, 
and it has a ripple effect because if you don't take care of something ahead of time, it starts to deteriorate faster and cost more to repair. And so with that less money for our roadways, you'll see our roadways deteriorate more in the future. So were there specific projects that we deferred and what were the value of those? Uh, we had specifically, we $700,000 reduction in our gas tax is what we had. And the, the median project was one of them. And then our slurry projects, we hadn't specifically determined which projects those would be yet. So that's just on the gas tax side. That's not the general fund side. But I, as you mentioned, the, now that we move forward on YVR, we cannot go fix the median. So that's, that's right. But what do you, so you can't estimate what amount of, slur, uh, of funding would have been used for the slurry seal projects and the overlay? Uh, it'd be right around the seven hundred thousand dollars. I mean, it just kind oh, okay. of ripples through. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And were there any other projects that um, we had to forego that would have been funded not by gas tax but by the contribution that we annually make to the capital budget from the general fund? Yeah. So the general fund was, was reduced by, um, you know, we just take a two percent of the actual budget that we're bringing in and the budget was reduced, which reduces the amount of general fund that goes to maintenance. So that's kind of how it happened. And a couple of the major locations that we um, reduced was the work that we spent on our trip and falls, the concrete work on our trip and falls, and also for drainage projects. Um, and that's one thing we've been doing is doing some analysis of our drainage facilities. And we're finding out that a lot of our corrugated pipes are starting to rust out. And so we have some pipe replacement projects that we've deferred and um, also some HVAC work at the city hall we've deferred also. So those are three of the bigger projects that um, we've deferred. And that's once again, six to $700,000 worth of work. Anything else you'd like to tell us? Otherwise, what is that behind you? Oh, National Public Works Week. <laughs> Well, the smaller the, the squares get, the harder it is to decipher what it is. You know, we also, you know, part of this budget is we did lose staffing that's not coming back um, as part of the new budget. So we've lost four staff members. And some of that impact you're going to see is our better response to homeless encampments and some of our maintenance work in our parks. Um, so those will be kind of something you'll notice also. Thank you. I, I appreciate the the level of detail you were able to provide. Okay, let's go to uh, Mayor Pro Tem Francois. I don't have any questions at this time, thank you. Okay, uh, I don't have any questions either. I think that's everybody on the questions. So um, let's see if anybody from the public has any comments. This is just again on the Q3 budget. We just finished Q3 and so this is just receiving the report. The larger budget discussion will happen at the next on the next agenda item. So, does any member of the public, excuse me, does any member of the public wish to have a comment on the Q3 budget? This is the time to raise your hand if you do. Mayor, I don't see any hands raised for comment on this item. Okay, we will close the public comment for item five A and bring it back to council. Any further comments from any, from council members on this? Um, council member Haskew. I just want to reiterate the really great work that the staff has done in terms of holding the house together and, and cutting down what they needed to cut down to keep us in balance and to put us in this really pretty COVID extraordinary situation. So many other cities are in much worse shape than Walnut Creek. So thank you very much for all the work you've done. I appreciate it deeply. And thank you for making what is a fairly complex situation um, as um, council member Darling says, approachable um, because, because um, you patiently explain it so that things make sense to people. So appreciate all the work you've done. Um, and I will ultimately make the motion that we accept the report. Okay, we have a motion. Do we need to authorize the ARPA money too, or just the, accept the report? 
No, the motion includes the authorization. Okay. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Councilmember Silva. Um, again, thank you very much to staff. And I really want to um, commend all of staff for how we managed through this past year. Um, two comments. One is I fully support the use of the $4 million of the American Rescue Plan Act monies toward the parking fund, the rebound program and the restaurant grant program. So I will be supporting the motion. The reason I asked about um, the other staff members to talk about the capital projects that had to be deferred in both the parking fund and on roads, drainage, city hall, was so that we had a picture of that going into that next discussion that we're going to have, because I think we have to keep all of that in mind. We were unable to do those projects because we've lost revenues, which is exactly what the American Rescue Plan funds are for. And I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that June 15th, everything does go to green because I know that there's still a lot of, we're still in the orange. We don't know that our public health officer is going to go there. So we will breathe a sigh of relief. I'm looking at Labor Day. So, but thank you very much, Mayor. Wow. All right. <laughs> I hope that's not the case. Uh, okay. So, uh, and, and my comments, first of all, thank you very much, not, staff, as well as the finance committee. Um, I, I know how hard it is to be on that finance committee, committee as well and, and start to weed through this before it gets to council. Uh, thank you, Luella, uh, Luella and Matt. And then for last year, Cindy, you and I were on the finance committee and actually hearing what they had to say about the year ahead and it was not good. We were cutting and it was, it was obviously a worst case scenario and it is pleasantly surprised to see the diligent work that you all did in putting together the budget that at this point is good news. I don't think any of us thought that looking at Q3 this year was going to be good news. So thank you so much. Appreciate that. And, um, and I'll also be uh, voting to approve and accept this too. So with that, um, Susie, why don't you call the roll? Councilmember Haskew. Aye. Councilmember Darling. Aye. Councilmember Silva. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Francois. Aye. And Mayor Will. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. All right. Uh, right. 10 minutes. I was, I was going to ask if anybody would like a break. So let's take a 10 minute break at 7.30. Let's reconvene at 7.40.
And we're back. The next item on the agenda is the fiscal year 2021, uh, whoops, whoops, excuse me, fiscal year 2022 and fiscal year 2023 proposed general fund budget and master fee schedule. And I now invite the staff to provide the presentation. Yeah, good evening, uh, Mayor. I'm gonna kick things off here for this item, Dan Buckshy, city manager. And uh, this is the next step in our budget process that began many, many months ago. Um, in the fall at the staff level to begin preparing and begin at the start of this year with finance committee and with your council. And uh, the last update of the finance committee was on May 5th, at which there were several staff recommendations that were made at that time. The finance committee reviewed uh, obviously the budget on May 5th and made the recommendations that are before your full council this evening. So those are incorporated into this proposed budget uh, tonight. You know, I do want to highlight that the budget does continue to improve. Our revenues uh, continue to trend upward, especially sales tax. So we did have a, a big drop, uh, but they do continue to improve and, and we're in a, a good spot in that, uh, you know, things are better than we thought they were a year ago. You know, things were looking very, very bleak a year ago. And that with the, the lessening and loosening of the health orders and what at least from my perspective, has been a truly incredible rollout of the vaccine in which uh, it's much more broadly available and vaccination numbers are much higher than what would have been anticipated at this point in time. Um, we're, we're further along and there's a lot of reason for optimism. And with that in mind though, I do wanna state that uh, while there is good reason for optimism, we are far from back to normal. As, a, as we just heard on our last update, you know, we were looking at a $12 million hole a year ago for the current year budget. And of that, we made about $10 million of cuts, of which $6 million was ongoing. And uh, to clarify, we've not added back that $6 million. And so even without adding that back, you know, when you look at the fiscal year 22 and 23 budget, the fiscal year 22, we're slightly in the red, and we're using some of the um, ARPA funds, not only to add some resources, but to help balance the gap. And then in fiscal year 23, even as we continue to improve, we're only slightly above uh, break even. And so what I do want to you know, point out is the difficult decisions that your council made a year ago have definitely paid off. They were very difficult. Um, and that if they hadn't been made, if we hadn't made that six million, the six million dollars of ongoing cuts, we'd be looking at a six to seven or possibly eight million dollar gap before us today. And so I mentioned that uh, there is good reason for optimism. Uh, I recommend it be cautious optimism. And I do want to note that uh, even with this budget that we are proposing is considerably improved, we should still anticipate considerable service level reductions as to where we were prior to COVID-19 because we are still down about 10 staff and we're still not adding back many of the resources that were reduced. So uh, overall, this is good news. We're on the right track, but we still have a ways to go before we'll feel more secure that we're on very sound financial footing going forward. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to our Administrative Services Director, Kirsten Lacasse. Thank you, Dan. Good evening, Mayor Wilk, Mayor Pro Tem Francois, and members of the council. Um, tonight, I'm going to present our second look at the fiscal year 22 and 23 proposed budget and master fee schedule proposed changes. And I'm going to pause along the way. This is a lot of information, so I want to give you the opportunity to interject questions if necessary. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully, you can all see that clearly. So tonight we will be discussing the assumptions that we built into the development of the budget and then talk about what has changed since then. Then we're going to go through the fiscal year 22 and 23 general fund revenues and expenditures, what's included in the proposed budget and then any changes since we last discussed this with you on April 20th. We'll then discuss the American Rescue Plan Act and the possible areas that may be eligible for funding for fiscal years 22 and 23. And then we'll touch briefly on the parking fund revenue and expenditures, and then discuss the proposed changes to the master fee schedule. And then lastly, we will go through the remaining budget development calendar. 
So when we began budget development back in the fall, as Dan mentioned, we made several assumptions based on the guidance and the information that we had at the time. So back in fall of 2020, we anticipated being in the state's yellow tier as of July 1. Most of the vulnerable and frontline workers would be vaccinated. Personal protective equipment and social distancing would continue to be required. Health restrictions would continue to loosen over the budget cycle and we would be experiencing continued economic recovery from the fiscal year 20 recession. So as we all know, we've experienced a lot of change and it's happening rapidly. And so now we're in May of 2021, we're in fact in the orange tier as of April 7th, and California is anticipating a full reopening on June 15th, and they're already discussing the mask requirements or adjusting as we speak. And on May 10th, the FDA added children ages 12 to 15 to the approved use of the Pfizer vaccine across the US. So now it's available to people ages 12 and up. Contra Costa County reached 1 million vaccine doses administered well ahead of the original target date of July 4th. And we have, the, we have ARPA, which was um, passed back in March and it's the first COVID relief package that provides for local governments. So again, as we've seen, things are continually changing and so we need to remain flexible as we go forward. So back in April, when we came to you with the first look of the biennial budget, we had a base budget surplus in year one of approximately 260,000 and 1.96 million in year two and an ARPA allocation, which as Katie mentioned, was reduced slightly since we were last here and it is now 8.33 million. So we're here today to discuss the budget requests in more detail and also outline the proposed funding sources for those requests. So as you just heard, we had requested and you had approved using four, up to 4 million of ARPA funding to offset pandemic related revenue loss in, as well, in the parking fund, as well as the restaurant grant program and offsetting the cost for the rebound. So we refined our fiscal year 22 and 23 recommended requests in the general fund. So the first year, the approximate cost is about 700,000 and in the second year, about 650,000. And we'll also talk about the ARPA requests, which total 2.38 million over the two years. In fiscal year 22, the, the city will continue to experience revenue loss compared to pre-pandemic levels. Therefore, we're recommending the use of ARPA funds to close the gap in fiscal year 22 and that's roughly 440,000. So that then would balance fiscal year 22. We would have a surplus in fiscal year 23 of about 1.31 million and remaining ARPA funds of 1.51 million. So next I'll discuss the general fund revenue categories that are experiencing significant change over the next two years. So we'll look at property tax, sales and use tax, transient occupancy tax, and the department revenues. So this chart shows the breakout of the city's revenue budget by category. So sales tax makes up the largest piece at 34% with property tax at 32%. Sales tax and department revenues were the most negatively impacted by the pandemic, and they make up over 61% of our general fund budget. So looking at our revenue highlights, our general revenues, we're seeing continued growth in our property tax category. So it's approximately three and a half percent in fiscal year 22 and 5% in fiscal year 23. Sales tax is projected to grow beyond fiscal year 19 levels beginning in fiscal year 22. And transient occupancy tax, still seeing a slow recovery from the pandemic and will likely not return to pre-pandemic levels until fiscal year 25. Department revenues overall are increasing over the next two years. And the, the reason for that is partly for community development. There's projecting a revenue growth increase of 1% in fiscal year 22, 6% in fiscal year 23. Arts and Recreation Department is projecting an increase in revenue as public health orders loosen their restrictions. The Lesher Center is anticipated to reopen in fall of 2021. And the Police Department revenues increased based on reimbursable overtime that was included in the budget. When we look at our year over year revenue changes, we can see how quickly we're going, we anticipate the different revenue streams will get back to our fiscal year 
19 levels. And again, we've mentioned this before, but fiscal year 19 is our base for it's because it is the full year, full fiscal year pre-pandemic. So we can use that as basically our baseline to, to compare to. So this table highlights those revenue categories that have the most notable changes. So you can see in property tax, they have seen growth throughout the pandemic. So they haven't been affected the way the other revenue streams have. Sales tax is anticipated to grow above pre-pandemic levels in the first year of the two-year budget. And based on the third quarter projections that Katie just went through, we will be close to pre-pandemic levels at the end of the current fiscal year. TOT has taken a huge hit in both fiscal year 20 and 21. And as I mentioned, will likely not return to pre-pandemic levels until fiscal year 25. Arts and Recreation was hit hard with the pandemic. Their revenues will increase over the next two years and they will are anticipating getting back to pre-pandemic levels around fiscal year 25 as well. And so we've talked a lot about revenue loss compared to pre-pandemic levels. So this chart shows the loss each year compared to fiscal year 19. The total fiscal year 19 general fund revenue was just over 90 million. So when the pandemic hit in fiscal year 20, we lost 7.4 million in revenues. In fiscal year 21, we're projecting to lose about 10.7 million. We do not fully recover those losses in fiscal year 22. So you can see we're down still about 4.9 million in the proposed budget. In fiscal year 23, we start to come out slightly ahead of pre-pandemic levels. So while we see some revenue categories are starting to increase, again, overall, we're not yet close to getting back to where we were. And just as a reminder, our fiscal year revenue loss of 7.4 million was over a three month period. So we did have the preceding nine months of regular activity and our fiscal year 21 projections, we are projecting we're gonna lose that 10.7 million over a 12 month period. So this chart shows the comparison of each department's revenues by fiscal year. So as you can see, 50% of our department revenue sources will not return to pre-pandemic levels within the next two year budget cycle. I want to pause here for a moment and just to see if you have any questions so far. Does any member of the council have any questions? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you. Um, the last two slides that you presented, which compared the revenues from 2019, if you could go back one, maybe one more. It was a number where all of the revenues from 2019 have been adjusted based on the changes in our counting procedures. Yes, so that's correct. Charts reflect that. So we're we're now not so, doing currency conversion as I described it a year ago. Correct, yes. So it's apples to apples comparison. And I do appreciate you adding in the 2019 actuals to basically be able to keep track of this. Thank you, I appreciate that. And that was, and I appreciate you stopping and asking for questions. Okay, moving on. Okay, so next I will go through our expenditures. So we had, were before you on April 20th with our base budget. So we're gonna talk about the proposed fiscal year 22 and 23 budget and then the recommended requests. So our, this chart here demonstrates the fiscal year 22 and 23, the general fund expenditures by category. So our personnel is close to 70% of our general fund budget with operation and maintenance and transfers out the other 30%. And the, our three biggest departments, police, police, arts and recreation and public works total about 73% of our general fund budget. So back when we presented the base budget on April 20th, we talked about what was included in that base. So just as a quick reminder, we had the cost of living increases per the existing MOUs, contributions to capital, uh, at 2% of general fund revenues per our policy. We had the restoration of one-time reductions taken in fiscal year 21, which was about 2.2 million. Additionally, there are other fixed costs like increases in utilities and known custodial cost increases. So what has changed since we were here in April? So we've included in this 
budget look, the general fund recommended requests. Year one would then increase by about 700,000 and year two increases by about 650,000. And so I'm gonna walk through the requests and also provide additional detail. And then the recommend, just as a side note, the recommended ARPA funded requests are not included in this. And we're gonna talk about those separately in a, later on in the presentation. So our general fund recommended requests, we have diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is comprised of annual staff training and task force facilitation and recommendations. We have crisis intervention and response training, regional mobile crisis response. And these three categories combined total approximately 500,000 and they're recommended as ongoing. The additional requests include financial analyst, as well as 200,000 set aside for the sustainability action plan on a one-time basis. So next I'm going to talk about the American Rescue Plan Act. And so as we've mentioned, we have the 8.33 million allocation, which is divided into two installments that are one year apart. And the goals are to stabilize government, economic recovery and uplifting communities. So back in April, we walked through the extra library options provided by the county. And then based on the feedback from April 20th, staff has included the funding of the full core team for both years. However, the city will continue to pursue a partner for fiscal year 23. This is, a, and this is recommendation is in line with the HCD committee's recommendation. We spoke in broad terms about the economic development and recovery. So we're gonna provide additional detail in a later slide for that category. And today we're also going to discuss recommendations for utilizing the ARPA to balance fiscal year 22, based on the lost revenue from the effects of the pandemic, increased funding for crossing guards, air filtration improvements in city facilities, and Walnut Creek downtown's request for support. So as you recall, the city did not fund the extra 21 hours at the libraries in fiscal year 21 as part of budget balancing. Contra Costa County Library reevaluated their extra hours formula. So they're now providing 40 base hours weekly instead of previously 35, which is a change that's effective July 1st. And they've standardized their extra hour options that are available to all cities in Contra Costa County that utilize their services. So it's either six, 12 or 16 additional hours, which are shown as options A, B and C. And the, their, the cost increased significantly between options A and B, just as a reminder, it's due to the need to add staff for the additional day the libraries would be open. And the incremental cost of going from six to 12 hours is about 370,000. And it would take an additional 148,000 to add another four hours weekly. And when we went to finance committee, the recommendation was option B, which would be 52 weekly hours. And based on what we know at this time, this request is ARPA eligible. The category of economic development recovery and city services includes the city internet update, the sign ordinance update, economic development project manager, economic development marketing and communications, as well as re-envisioning downtown, and then community development administrative support. So the ARPA funds over the two year period for this is about 80,000 and it adds to FTE. So the additional recommendations that we wanna share with you this evening are, the um, increased funding for crossing guards. So the cost increase to the city is approximately 60,000 and that's based on a 12% increase in the contract for services. And it assumes that 10 of the 12 sites continue to cost share with the city. So per council feedback, staff is recommending 100,000 of funding for upgrading seven facility HVAC systems for ionization. And Walnut Creek downtown has requested approximately 31,000 in waived fees and rent to assist them in recovering from the impacts of the pandemic as they continue to support and advocate for their members. So 
this chart provides a summary of all of the recommended uses of ARPA funding that we've, we've talked about for fiscal year 21, 22, and 23. So as we've mentioned, it, the allocation is 8.33 million and it will be split over fiscal year 21 and 22. The first three items reflect fiscal year 21 uses and that's the total of 4 million that Katie discussed earlier. Additionally, we have our lost revenue to offset our fiscal year 22 deficit of 440,000. The extra library hours, which is option B, the 12 hours, and it's 1.04 million over the two year period. Core homeless outreach, again, this is to fund a full team. And that's 280,000 over the two year period. Economic development and city services is approximately 810,000. Crossing guards over the two years is 120,000. Air filtration at the city facilities of 100,000. And then the Walnut Creek downtown request of about 30,000. So in fiscal year 21, we would be using up to 4 million. In 22, it would be 1.69 million. And then in fiscal year 23, 1.13 million. So we would have at the end of the day, approximately 1.51 million remaining of ARPA funds. So I could pause here and see if there are any questions so far before we talk about our FTE changes. Any questions from council? I had I had one, Mayor. Um, Kirsten, I'm not sure if it's you or other staff that could answer on the crossing guards, which are the two schools that aren't able to cost share with the city? I believe Katie has that information. Do you have that with you? Yes, I believe it is uh, Foothill Middle School and Walnut Acres Elementary have uh, express that they will not be able to contribute uh, in the next fiscal year. Did they give any further elaboration why that, that's the case? Uh, I would defer to Heather Ballinger for additional detail. Okay. I can check in with her offline. Um, and then no ARPA funds are proposed to be used for any parking fund deficit in fiscal year 22 or 23, is that right? That's correct. And we'll cover the parking fund as well a little further on in the presentation, but yes, th there is not a need for it in those two fiscal years. Okay, thank you. Let me, and if I could actually add on to Matt's question on the crossing guards. So those are two schools in the Mount Diablo School District. Does that mean that the other schools in the Mount Diablo School District, uh, those being Bancroft and Valley Verde are paying for their own crossing guards or, or helping at least? The other 10 sites do cross uh, cost share for the crossing guards with the city. We have not heard from other schools at this point in terms of any type of budget constraints they may have. We've only heard from those two schools. Okay, all right, thank you. Any other questions from council? Or we'll keep on rolling here. All right, uh, Cindy Silva. Thank you, Mayor. If I have questions about the economic development and city services line item on this, should I ask it now or would you like me, Kirsten, to ask it later because it does require other staff to come in? Uh, if it can wait, that would be great. great. I'll wait. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we'll move along. Okay, so the proposed net FTE change over the two, next two year budget cycle is 1.50 FTE. So the changes in fiscal year 22 represent 1.5 FTE reduction for two limited duration positions that expire in fiscal year 21, and both of those are vacant. The addition of one FTE in general government is an economic development project manager that I mentioned earlier. Additions of two FTE in fiscal year 23 include a financial analyst in administrative services and an office specialist in community development. And so as a reminder, our pre-pandemic FTE count in fiscal year 19, we had authorized FTE of 378. And so in our, uh, we were still down almost those 10 FTE even with these changes.
So we've talked a, there a lot, we have a lot of moving pieces um, and a lot of information today, but we have recommendations we brought forward at a high level back on April 20th. And then we have some additional recommendations that we've introduced to you today, which in, in all of this includes two sources of funding. So this slide is intended to summarize all of the requests and, and demonstrate which sources of funding we're looking at. So this, the table, um, Groups are requested high, at high level categories. And then, as I mentioned, separates out the additional considerations. The budgetary impact for all of these requests, as I mentioned before, in the general fund is about 700,000 in fiscal year 22, 650,000 in fiscal year 23. The ARPA allocations total 1.7 million in fiscal year 22 and 1.13 million in fiscal year 23. The total ongoing impact is 1.78 million and the one-time impact over the two years is about 810,000. And it's important to remember that the ARPA funds are one-time, therefore ongoing costs, the ongoing costs that ARPA is funding of 1.13 million will impact the general fund beginning in fiscal year 24 if we were to go forward with those. So I'm going to discuss those in further in a few moments. Were there any questions on this slide? No questions, okay. speak up. No, okay. So at this point, I, we've talked a lot about the ongoing costs over the two years that we're adding to the budget, but I think it's important to look at what we had to reduce in fiscal year 21. So this slide gives you a comparison. So in fiscal year 21, and this is focused on the ongoing, costs. So we reduced $7 million in ongoing costs in fiscal year 21 in order to balance the budget. And it was made up of about 2 million in personnel and then a 5 million in operations and maintenance. Within personnel, we had permanent pay reductions as well as the elimination of 10 FTE. On the O&M side, we reduced supplies, professional services, travel and training, and we eliminated the extra library hours. So in fiscal year 22 and 23, we are adding to the budget. However, we are not adding back with the exception of the library hours, any of those ongoing reductions. So the 1.78 million is made up of general fund requests of about 650,000. And then the ARPA recommendations that I, we just talked about of 1.13 million. So the general fund requests consist of the DEI and mental health response and one FTE. And for ARPA, we have our extra library hours, the full core team, the increased cost for the crossing guards. We have two FTE that we talked about in economic development and community development. And then we have our economic development and recovery programs as well. Can I ask, Kirsten, can I ask a question on that? When you say ongoing additions, Economic development and recovery, that's just for fiscal year 22 and 23, right? There's a portion of that that is ongoing. So the, the portion that is referenced here is the ongoing piece, which does include one FTE, but other additional programming that I would, I would defer to Terry Kilgore to provide more information, but it does include ongoing costs. Okay, and so I'll move to the next slide. So, so next we wanted to provide you with an estimated longer term impact of adding these ongoing ARPA requests, which are short term in nature. So scenario 1A on the left was presented to you on March 2nd. And so it added one FTE annually beginning in fiscal year 23. And so the comparison now is the budget reconciliation scenario to on your right, which takes scenario 1A, but then incorporates all of the general fund proposed budget for the first two years. So where, what you see here is the deficit is the deficit we talked about of about 440,000, and then the surplus in year two of about 1.31 million. So the, then, Beginning in fiscal year 24, we added in the ongoing ARPA requests, the 1.13 million. And then additionally, 
this scenario adds the equivalent of one FT annually beginning in fiscal year 25 and beyond. And so you can see that the estimated impact to the 10 year forecast by adding these ongoing costs is not as significant as we might have thought. And that's primarily due to the increased sales tax revenue projections. And back when we came to you in March with this scenario, we didn't have the most updated sales tax information because we did not have the fiscal year second quarter, the holiday sales at that point. So now we have more refined projections. And so those, those revenues increased. Are there any questions? Ooh. Mayor? Yes. Um, Tristan, thank you very much mm -hmm. for showing this. So if I'm catching, if I'm getting this correctly, how long do the ARP funds last in the chart on the right? They last for the fiscal year 22 and 23. So just the two year budget cycle. This okay. is it, it based on, I'm sorry, based on the recommendations, this does not consider the remaining ARPA funds that are not requested to be programmed at this time. And then for fiscal years 24, 25, and 26, those numbers, obviously the net, the net um, surplus that is predicted is reflective of higher sales tax, but also there are costs that are now being factored against that, those ongoing costs related to core crossing guards. Okay. Yes, that's correct. And, and just not reflect what I, we were talking about during the previous staff report budget item, which was those capital costs that actually have been deferred and haven't been captured as potential one-time needs. That's correct. They are not reflected here. Okay. And the it, and as you recall from when we, we talked about the, the 10 year forecast back in March, the recession assumption is that it would begin in fiscal year 27, which is why you see it turning in, into the red at that point. But let me go back. So we are still assuming the next recession is fiscal year 27. Yes. But that's a normal seven years out cycle. Yes, it is. We, we did update what are they that. Saying? Did we just have a recession or did we have a pandemic and we could and we're not really sure when the next recession cycle is? What what do you think the economists are saying? They probably can't. Agree. So, yeah. So my interpretation is that the recession came early as a result of the pandemic. So the, they're looking at the pandemic. Uh, sorry, as the recession starting in fiscal year 20. So then the next one would be in fiscal year 27 at the seven year business cycle. Yeah, let me just add to this. I think this is the challenge with calling this a forecast as opposed to a trend analysis, because trying to forecast when a, when a recession may occur, a growth spurt is, is impossible. And so we do plot it out for every you know seven years as, as we've done here and we discussed previously, just because that's the average cycle, but we know recessions don't work on the average. So. This just takes the cost, projects them out with you know certain inflators and assumptions, and then does the same for when a recession hits, what the average drop would be. But there's no doubt there's a lot of discussion. Coincidentally, for what it's worth, I did just uh, sit in on a forecast update uh, by UCLA earlier today, and uh, more or less they're stating that the exodus out of California is being overblown and overstated. It's not been much larger than what's been happening uh, on a regular basis and that venture capital that's coming into California remains strong, particularly into the Bay Area. And so more or less, they were stating that it was a big drop that, uh, you know, those in the service industry and not surprisingly, the uh, tourism industry were hit the hardest, um, but those that were able to work remotely didn't really didn't see much of a hit. And so there was a big drop that they're projecting a a big snapback, and now obviously there's a lot of discussion about uh, potential inflation down the road and, and what that may be uh, may occur. So uh, we're not trying to predict when a recession may occur. We're just showing the trends of what it could look like uh, if one were to occur seven seven year periods. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Okay, let's keep going. Okay. So next I'm gonna talk about the general fund reserves. So as you recall, 
Council authorized the use of reserves in both fiscal year 20 and 21 in order to balance the budget, but fortunately we didn't need to use the reserves in fiscal year 20 and we're projecting we will not need to use them in fiscal year 21 either. So the estimated reserve balance at the end of the current fiscal year is 45 million, which includes the pension reserves. So based on these balances and the reserve policy, we will not need to contribute to reserves in fiscal year 22. However, in fiscal year 23, we're, need, we're going to need to contribute about 300,000 for our city policy. And the estimated balance for June 30th at 2023 is 45.3 million. And our, so our total reserves do exceed GFOA, Government Finance Officers Association's recommended reserve level of 17% of our general fund expenditures. And what is not included in this total is our workers' comp reserve, which form, formerly was in the general fund, but now resides in a separate fund. And so the fiscal year 22 and 23 proposed general fund budget would have total revenues in fiscal year 22 of 86.99 million, and that includes the offsetting ARPA revenues. The expenditures would total 86.99 as well. The recommended ARPA requests include the 440,000 approximate amount to cover the deficit in fiscal year 22 from the continued revenue loss. So our fiscal year 22 would then be balanced. In fiscal year 23, we'd have revenues of 92.94 million, total expenditures of 91.33. We would contribute to reserves about 300,000. And so we would have a surplus after those reserve contributions of 1.31 million. So that concludes the portion of the general fund. I don't know if there are any additional questions at this point, otherwise we can move into the parking fund. Actually, I'll ask a quick question as it relates to the library hours in general. Um, I could have before, but I wanted to wait to get through all of that. So the ARPA funds, actually, there are enough to cover 16 hours uh, additional a year. Is that right? If we were to program additional ARPA funds, yes. And the recommendation from the Finance Committee is that we keep 12 and 12 for the two years, not that we step it up from 12 to 16? Correct. It was option B, yes. Okay. All right, that's it for now, thanks. Kirsten, could you go back to the previous slide? I'm trying to match that slide with staff report table. This slide, okay. The 2022 ARPA recommendation requests Does that include the forty, the four hundred and forty thousand? No, those are the four hundred and forty thousand is in the ARPA revenue. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we will move into the parking fund. So the assumptions that were built into the base budget for the parking fund are that on or before July 1, charging at the purple poles will resume. And we now know that's happening this week. So that's happening earlier than anticipated. The outdoor dining continues. So those spaces will not be revenue generating for the two year budget cycle. Parking enforcement will be at 85% capacity in fiscal year 22 and 95% capacity in fiscal year 23. So the proposed budget for parking includes contract service cost increases for parking sensors and garage management, restoring funding for downtown events beginning in fiscal year 23, a contribution to capital of 350,000 for each year of the two year budget, and then no significant changes to personnel. So based on this, parking fund will end fiscal year 22 with a slight surplus of about 40,000 and a surplus in fiscal year 23 of about 540,000. So next we're gonna talk about the master fee schedule. So the, the changes are listed here by department. So in arts and recreation, updating the fee ranges to reflect the increasing costs, maintaining cost recovery goals and reflecting changes in market conditions. 
Community development is proposing increases for various permits for planning and inspection services. There are some new fee categories for community benefits program. And there are an addition of fees related to housing processes. In general government, there are proposed increases for the review of development projects by the city attorney and then in public works engineering, some proposed increases for planning and inspection services. So in summary, we've talked about our proposed general fund budget. It would be balanced in fiscal year 22 based on the recommendations, and we would have a surplus of 1.31 million in fiscal year 23. The use of ARPA funds would be about 600, I'm sorry, 6.82 million over the three fiscal years, leaving about 1.51 million remaining in unprogrammed funds. Our proposed parking fund budget has no real significant changes. And then our master fee schedule, we have some updated fee ranges and new fees. And so we're here with you tonight to, we talked about the operating budget, the master fee schedule, and then also reported out on the third quarter update. And so next steps would be June 15th for the fiscal year 22-23 operating and capital budget adoption and the second reading of the master fee schedule. So what we're asking of you this evening is to provide feedback on the proposed general fund and parking fund budgets, as well as the uses of the ARPA stimulus funds for fiscal years 22 and 23, and the proposed changes to the master fee schedule for those same two years. And that concludes the presentation and staff is available for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. Uh, all right, so let's see if we have any questions from council, uh, I guess for the entire presentation at this point. Um, yeah, Cindy Darden. Um, I was curious what the basis of the finance committee recommendation going for 12 hours on library hours instead of the full 16. Um, And I don't know, that's not a staff quest. I guess that's a, a finance committee question. I don't know if that's legitimate to ask that here, but. I'll, I'll take a, a stab at it. I think we were trying to balance a number of different things. Um, some of them are the increased ongoing costs for the full funding of the core team. That's $120,000. Then looking at increased costs for the crossing guards of $60,000 and keeping in mind what, what we had paid for before the pandemic was about $567,000 a year for the extra library hours. That was for 21 extra hours. The 12 extra hours that we're proposing to put in this budget is 519,000. So we're paying 519,000 for 12 extra hours when we were we used to pay 567,000 for 21 extra hours. Um, the, the other thought was that the Library Foundation had, had generously offered to uh, donate $50,000 to be used for the library funds over the two years. So that was to the extent there was an effort to try to get to the full 16 and the, the revenues looked like they could do that in the second year, I think that that could those funds could be used for that purpose. And I think just stepping back to really not knowing what's going to happen. I was in the in the library on Saturday and it's really just a, a, a pickup uh, operation right now. The tables are all blocked off still. The conference rooms are all blocked off. And hopefully that'll turn around on, on June 15th or July 1st. But I think none of us really know that for certain. So it's trying to go for a middle was trying to go for the middle road of the Goldilocks approach on the library hours. Okay. And then, so if, even though we're passing a two-year budget, we have the process at the end of each year to go through and say, do we have money left over? And, you know, so there is a potential place. This is my still learning how to do budgets in a city step. Not money left over. That's an unassigned fund surplus. Unassigned funds, yes. Unassigned funds. When there's unassigned funds, there no, is the possibility. No, not for ongoing. You don't use one-time money for ongoing costs.
my my genuine concern is that if we go in for the whole 52 50, whole schmear um we're going to have to back down um there is not a lot of slack anywhere in this budget um i just did the calculation and our surplus is less than two percent of our revenues that's not any slack at all one little thing falls out of of expectation and we're and we're scrambling and it doesn't make a lot of sense to to overload it right now and have to go back to the public and say again we can't afford extra hours we're going to go back to what the county will let us have at 40. it's a huge drop and it it doesn't it doesn't feel good to, to, to do that to people um, when they're expecting the thing. Also, uh, to quote somebody who I was talking to today, um, library use is changing. A, a lot of what we're used to is the old method, but a lot of people are more used to doing things electronically. Um, they come in and they load, download the books and things like that. It, it isn't, it, it yet again is like downtown. We don't know what the next two to five years are going to look like in any of the things that we're used to. So it didn't make any sense. I, I mean, my gut instinct is if we do any, any hours, it's the additional six. Um, that kind of guilted me into moving up. Um, but, but I'm still not comfortable with it at all. Um, I, I just, I am just so concerned about um, how tenuous all of this is. Usually we have a feeling of confidence. I'm not as confident as our sales tax projectors that our sales tax are going to be as strong. And I can think of 20 reasons why that. So not the least of which is it's, you can't spend on things we were spending before because we don't have the um, circuits. We don't have the wood supply. We don't have everything. People are waiting for things to pay for six and eight months. It's it's the, the supply side is so disrupted. I don't know what is going to happen. If you take any of the small tweaks and you assume that everything is going to go happily along based on, on those percentages, we're asking for trouble. I think that's that's a really good point on especially on fiscal year 22 where it's just dead even there's there's no wiggle room at all but but uh council member darling also on the the 12 extra hours does get the library open six days a week which i think is significant um whereas just the six extra hours it's only open five five days a week so the difference between 12 and 16 is basically it would be open two more hours at night two days a week but it's, it's still open six days a week. It's still open late, uh, two nights a week, and it's open on, on Saturday. Okay. Um, Matt, do the, do the Saturday hours change if it's 12 or 16 hours additional? They don't, it's nine to five in either scenario. Okay. Cindy. I had some questions. We'll come back to a debate on the policy questions, I'm sure. Um, Kirsten, again, thank you for all of this work. Thank you um, to Katie and your staff. The um, crossing guard, the base crossing guard costs that we were covering are in the base expenditures. The additional costs are really reflective of price increases and the um, inability of the two schools to help fund it. Correct. And then in terms of the homeless services, the base homeless services are covered. The additional costs that we are proposed to use the ARPA funds for are actually related to the rising costs from the county and the um, loss of Concord as a partner. Correct. The um, sustainability project fund that is proposed, I could have sworn that I thought we were going to do it on a recurring basis, the same way we do the homeless fund, because just doing it one time 
only gets a little bit, it doesn't get it, it's not a recurring commitment. Was there any discussion about that at the finance committee or did my understanding just not, wasn't everybody else's understanding? And I don't want to, uh, it. I just no, want to. You, you, you can put us on, I, I, I just accepted, I did just accept that the staff had gotten it right. Um, on further reflection, it makes sense that as the sustainability pro project goes forward, we are going to have um, jobs to do that cost money to meet our requirements uh, to, to live up to what we're trying to accomplish, that being one of our priorities. I think even if we only said at the original point, it should be one time money, I think we need to rethink that decision. Thank you. Um, another question is for um, Terry Kilgore and it's related to the proposed expenditures for the economic development work. Maybe she can come in and answer my question. I'm seeing a ghost. Terry's on. I know. I looked. I totally blasted out. Sorry, <laughs> but I can hear you. So. No, we can see you as well. Thank you, Terry. Um, very um, complete list of basically projects. But what about infrastructure? Things like if we decide, I mean, the last meeting we talked about maybe changes to the streets and changes to sidewalks, all of which might require infrastructure improvements because of the way the streets are built even. And granted, it, I'm not talking about $5 million, but is that included in the funds that, what, what of the funds are allocated for that? Um, that's a great question, Council Member Silva. So the $60,000 in fiscal year 23 under the economic development um, totals uh, was intended to get us started with some design work if there was interest in doing larger streetscape improvements. Um, the uh, project you heard about earlier this evening, the Locust Streetscape design that's currently unfunded, we had hoped there was um, some ability to piggyback there on design work as well. But given that that's unfunded and not occurring even until fiscal year 26, 27, that's not tenable. So for, for quick fixes like striping and putting in bollards and some you know little C capital work, um, I think we've got monies that we could tap into through the rebound program for some low cost items. But for the bigger streetscape items, um, those are currently not funded in the proposed budget. Well, that's disappointing. <laughs> well, it's, it, it is, but uh, at this point, um, you know, we need to, to have a little more clarity about what kind of changes we'd even be proposing. Um, so it, it seemed to us to warrant a follow up discussion with the Council as that program comes more into focus. So All right. Thank you. Can I ask a question on top of that? Um, I saw that we still had some ARPA money unallocated and but it was a relatively small amount. Is that at, in any way proportional to some of the changes that we're talking about downtown or? I would just add that if it is, it's a coincidence. It's not as if uh, it was retained uh, for that. Um, so, it, you know, there could be the potential to use some of that for those types of funding. The, the piece that we still need to work out is, you know, Department of Treasury just came out with some new guidance the past week that we're working through. And what's unclear, and this is why the capital work is, is uncertain with respect to ARPA, does it have to be encumbered or does it have to be fully spent by the end of 24? And as we know, depending on the nature of some capital projects, they can take a while. And so we wouldn't want to put the funding at risk by planning for a project if we can't spend it in the allotted time. So that's how we've taking a little bit of caution with ARPA and some of the bigger capital projects, but we're hoping in the next week, several weeks or possibly months, we'll receive more clarity and could answer some of those questions with greater certainty about the time frame and requirements to spend some of that funding. Okay, thanks. Sorry to interrupt, Cindy. Thanks. Um, no. And I had a question for public works staff who um, works with the library, but I know Heather 
is out of town. So is there anybody in public works staff who can answer a couple of questions maybe? Mr. Waymire is on the hot seat this evening as uh, acting director, so I'm sure he'd uh, like to give it a give it a go. So he's texting Heather, right? And I see Emlyn coming in too. We have a second screen now. Uh, they're both on uh, council member. Okay. Thank you. Um, in so the county sends us a letter. They give a standard, you know, option A, option B, option C, of how many hours, what days of the week, and then you turn the turn the letter over and you get a price tag. Was there any data as to why Monday is the is the day it's closed? What our patron attendance counts are pre-COVID on the six days a week. Is that data available? I mean, I know it's available. Let me see. Do we have it? Hi, this is Emlyn and I'm having some trouble with my video. Uh, but yes, they were able to provide us um, this afternoon with the attendance by date and the consensus across all library sites um, before I give some just to give some context on the specific Walnut Creek branch information. Um, the consensus is that the library is always busiest the day after it is closed. Um, so because it's always closed at all branches on Sundays, um, Monday is typically the busiest day. And that's been true for the Walnut Creek branch in the past. So if that were the case, why are they not providing Mondays in order to serve their patrons? That is an excellent question. Um, and if we wanted to follow up with the library and get that resolved um, for option A, and um, that's something we can inquire about. Let me just add to that briefly, if I could. Some of the feedback from the library is, is what Emlyn noted, that the day after the day that's closed is the busiest. So if it were, I believe there are some branches they had throughout that were closed on Mondays and Tuesday was their busiest day. So that was really the trend. So it's, for us, it's because Monday or Sunday was closed, Monday's busier. My second question is, did anybody talk to any other cities about what the library, what they're proposing to be charged for this same option A, B, and C? And the reason I ask is because I happen to be with other of our colleagues in five cities that have extra library hours. One of them can't afford it at all. They're not going there. And the others are trying to figure out, there isn't actually no conversation going on as to what they're going to fund other than an arenda because they have a parcel tax. What they noted when we compared was that there is no, there is no consistency as to what they're charging. And I, I'm ignoring the Walnut Creek downtown branch but the YV branch is smaller than all of their libraries, but is they wanna charge us more for the open hours of the YV branch, which is only 13,000 square feet, than they charge Lafayette, which is 30,000 square feet. And it just strikes me that something's amiss and that we need to actually do a little more research to find out why either they're underpaying or we're overpaying and I'm not, but, I'm getting really troubled by kind of all of this, this one size fits all, but it's not really one size fits all. So did anybody have any conversations with other cities? <laughs> I'm sorry, I decided to pontificate. We have not spoken to other cities, uh, but I can tell you which cities have opted for extra hours and what they cost. Uh, but getting back to your original question, the costs aren't linear as hours increase the library bases their costs off of how many personnel they need to hire. And unfortunately it differs site by site and based on the number of hours and days staffed. But you're right that it has uh, a level of opacity there. Well, I understand all that. And I will assure you 
that it takes more people to operate a 30,000 square foot library than it takes to operate a 13,000 square foot library. So there's something really wonky. And um, I'll just, but thank you for the, the information. That's, you're the, you're the messenger, not the, the source of my concerns. Thank you. Those are my questions at this point. Okay. Other questions from council? Okay, and, and, my, and my questions also were, well, I asked my questions about the library and I think that uh, Cindy brought us some good points that uh, a, a smaller branch, just by the very nature of it, would, would use fewer employees than a larger branch it, that something is off. And uh, unfortunately, we didn't investigate that prior to this meeting where uh, they're looking for an answer by, what is it, May 31st? So we're, we're right upon that. Um, so I think next what we'll do then is we'll open it up to uh, comments from the public. And this is the time that if a member of the public would wish to provide public comments, raise your hand or press star nine if you're connected by audio only, if you'd like to provide a public comment. For those who desire to provide a public comment on this consideration item, please raise your hand now. As a reminder, each speaker will have two minutes to make their oral remarks. Zoom feed for each speaker will cut off automatically at two minutes. Written comments submitted have been and will during this item be posted to the city's website for public review and are included in the meeting record but will not be separately read into the record. Also, please note that during public hearings and consideration items, group spokespersons are allotted 10 minutes in lieu of other members of the group speaking on an item. We trust that everyone will follow the rules. And at this time, I'll ask the city clerk if there are any members of the public who would like to provide comments. There, we do have at least one speaker. We'll go ahead and bring in Catherine Wally. Thank you. Hi, good evening, Council. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Good evening. It's Catherine Wally, resident of Walnut Creek. Um, I recently heard an analogy told by Miriam Kaba, which I think pertains to the budgetary decisions facing our community. Um, so imagine, if you will, an expansive desert with a lone burger stand. A long line of hungry people wait to get food. Based on the length of the line, one might assume that the burgers are delicious and popular. However, upon closer inspection, you realize that the food is of poor quality, satisfying some, nauseating to others while making many sick. You realize that the length of the line is a reflection of the limited options, not of the quality of the food and service. You realize you've overlooked how many people avoid the stand altogether preferring to risk starvation over the illness and suffering it is known to cause. One option is to pour more money into it, making it bigger, training its employees, giving them more money for tools and products. Uh, but the reality is that this approach has been tried in various iterations for 200 years and the outcomes remain the same. Instead, we can imagine investing in the creation of an array of food stands, offering a variety of options that meet the needs of everyone. We can also imagine that with these choices, the burger stand line would dramatically shorten. More people would be nourished, fewer people would be sick or starving, and that everyone would be able to access the types of foods that allow them to thrive. This, of course, is an analogy of how we have limited our imaginations when it comes to public safety by overinvesting in the criminal legal system and the prison industrial complex, and the ways in which, if we reallocate our resources away from the proverbial burger stand and instead invest in meeting the needs of everyone, we can create healthy, safe, and nourished communities. And so I invite us all in this community to consider this framework and when contemplating budget decisions facing our city, as well as when we as a city advocate for budgetary, policy, and legislative decisions on the county, state, and federal levels. We can free ourselves from the artificial limitations in budgets that we've imposed upon ourselves within our current framework and come out stronger for it. Thank you and have a good evening. Thank you. Mayor, I don't see any additional hands raised for public comment. Okay, seeing no more public comments, we will close the public comment of this portion and bring it back to council. And for any further comments that the council may have. Can I make, can I make a, ask a question or make a suggestion? Sure. We have three significant items. We have the proposed changes to the master fee schedule, which actually drives into the revenues. We have the basic general fund budget. And then we have these discussions about the use of the ARPA funds, which does affect the budget. I think 
I would prefer to take these independently of each other because otherwise we could get all no votes if we each of us didn't like one item <laughs> out of the whole package. Um, yeah. And I was going to suggest actually that we, and thank you for that, um, to go to, I think it was the last slide or maybe the next to last slide, which actually bucketed these areas. That was, I think it was that, it was a provide feedback on, right? Next, right there. So in this instance, how, uh, if we, why don't we look at the proposed general fund operating budget? We can make comments on that and then, uh, and then vote to approve and then we'll move on to the others. I was suggesting we do the master fee schedule first because it's cleaner. Oh, it's not, sure. It's not, it's not so intertwined back and forth with the ARP. I don't, know. I don't have an issue with that. Why don't we go to the master fee schedule first then? So we didn't talk about it. We didn't look at it. Um, I, it just occurs to me as I, I, I really spent yesterday looking at the the fee schedule and I didn't have any reason to oppose all of the changes or even really take anything. It's just that we have two years with the same numbers. And it seems to me that for the further out year, we should either um, up the top range uh, by some reasonable percentage, either cost of living or additional um, estimated employee costs or something, um, and and then that stops. Then then we don't have to keep revisiting it all every every year, and um, it allows us a little more freedom. And if we don't need to make a change, we're only we've only just up the the range. So that was my suggestion on the master fee plan. If everybody understood it, if anybody understood it. So you're you're saying to increase the fees for the second year of the no, I'm I'm saying increase the upper range. No fee actually has to has to, has to change. We range. would just have more freedom to, or the staff would have more freedom to change in the second year. A higher ceiling. A higher ceiling. Yeah. Have we done that in the past? I mean, I don't. Do we, or do we have any, maybe the question for staff, because I think, Luella, you might have a really good idea, but have we done, <laughs> have we needed to adjust the budget, the fee schedules in the um, second year of the two-year budget cycle, or have the fee ranges worked for us in the past? Deanna, I think that so, might be a question. You know, I'll, I'll attempt to answer. I mean, to my knowledge, we've lived within the parameters that have set by council. You know, if there were some type of a, a major anomaly, we might have to come back midstream. You know, that said, if you want a more detailed answer, I'm thinking that Kevin Safine would be our, our best bet to, to answer that. All right. Is he here? I see him on the list. Kevin Safin, come on down. I am here. Thank you. I'm Kevin Safin, Director of Arts and Recreation. Um, if I can repeat the question as I think I understood it is, um, do we typically or have we ever increased the top of the range, the ceiling, uh, as we adopt the budget or we come back to you in, in the second year? Um, I, I agree with the city manager. I think we live within the means unless there is an anomaly. That said, at least our department has come back occasionally with different fees. You know, we might offer a different program or different service that has a, a new fee range. <clears throat> and so um, we've done that uh, frequently in the second year 
as we develop these programs. So um, I wouldn't assume that if you adopt a fee schedule today or in the current budget process that we wouldn't come back to you um, in a year's time. So um, that staff, at least for my department, wouldn't be opposed to you increasing the, the top of the range in the second year with that, with that exception that we would potentially come back for other new fees. And, and, and I, and, and I, we, ex we expect that that's part of, that's part of the job, mm -hmm. but, but it just, it just seemed to me to just put top of the range, $200 in year one and top of the range in year two is $200. Why not make it, you know, 5% higher or something like that, that reflects potential um, increased inflationary costs, et cetera. Sure. I think that, again, that's appropriate. We typically don't establish our fees right up to the top of the, the range anyway. No, I know that. Right. I, I know so. that. I know these are theoretical numbers, yeah. but but supposing you hit the, at the end of the first year, you really do hit the top, mm -hmm. um, then then wouldn't you like to have a little wiggle room for the next year? A little room is always appreciated. So. Oh would it take and do we does that impact us getting through the first reading i guess at the first meeting in june no you could uh, you could amend if the council's direction were to include some percentage you know cpi based or something like that as an additional change then staff could incorporate that into the final version of the master fee schedule to be approved by the council as part of the june 15th meeting Okay. I mean, it, it, it doesn't sound like it would cost us any more. It might make sense. Luella, is there a motion that you would like to make that, uh, that we could vote on? I wasn't planning on making the uh, decision about the, the um, standard by which we'd increase it, but, but sure, let's just say a cost of living increase on the top of the, to the budget thing, it just, I mean, it, it was either make one thing a two-year thing, or or if you're going to have two separate year um, two separate year lists, then then shoot, take advantage and put a potential extra couple of dollars in. Yeah, just just before we vote on it, I I do notice it it would affect more than just ranges though. There's some administrative service fees that are just flat. These and I wonder is, is this I mean I think it's a good suggestion but it sounds like it hasn't necessarily been a problem in the past or should we at least give direction to staff to to look at the fees and see if there are any that they think you know what maybe we do want to adjust that one for inflation of course they could always come back to us in the second year of the budget and say hey we were, we need to increase this one which it sounds like that's happened in the past We could do it either way. Uh, I would offer it, you know, we understand the intent is to potentially increase the second year uh, by an inflationary figure, which I think we've been assuming 2.6 or 7% is part of the forecast. So if, if your council is interested in that concept, we could take that direction to see which fees are most likely uh, to apply that to, and then bring that back as part of June 15th, if that's uh, amenable to the council. I like that. Okay. Um, so motion. Is that, uh, Luella, do you want to make a motion on that just so that we get this? I, I make a motion that the staff do a, an analysis of those fees that are appropriate to um, inflation adjust 2.7% for the second year at the high end, leave the low end the same as the first year. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Susie, would you call the roll, please? Councilmember Haskew? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Francois? Aye. Councilmember Darling? Aye. Councilmember Silva? Aye. Mayor Wilk? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Okay, so that's that takes up care of the master fee schedule. Uh, do we want to move to the mayor if I can? can I, I think. I, I, that's what I understood the council to do too, but I think uh, council member Haskew's motion was more tightly worded than that. And so if the council is otherwise okay with the master fee schedule, it would be appropriate to say that as well too now, just so we have that for the record. All right, move to 
approve the master fee schedule with the change, the inflationary changes and recommendations made in the previous motion. Second. All right. Should we do the roll one more time here? Councilmember Silva. Aye. Councilmember Haskew. Aye. Councilmember Darling. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Francois. Aye. Mayor Welk. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Now, um, how about the proposed general fund operating budget and proposed parking fund budget? So uh, I'll start here. And um, I, these are just going to be general comments and we'll figure out how far we can get. On the general fund, we might have to separate the parking. Well, I'll do the parking. Maybe we should do the parking fund. Well, no, I'm just doing the general fund. Um, I think the rev the base revenue as presented is okay. The um, I think the expenses as presented, I will call them, I'm looking at table two in the staff report where the expenses um, also include items one through six of the recommended requests from the general fund. And um, I would propose that we add another $200,000 in the second year of the budget for the sustainability action plan projects. It's not a planning purpose, it's a investing in projects. And I would, if you want, and if you want to talk about the use of, maybe we should just stop there and see how far we get, Mayor. Okay. And I mean, we're not looking just to make sure. And Steve, let me ask you: Are you you're not looking for a vote on this, right? It's more direction right now for feedback. Yes, that we can yeah, feedback in the direction. Oh. Right. Okay. Well, let me clarify. Either would be fine. Uh, it depends how definitive you want to be in terms of what we bring back. So the goal tonight is that we have clear enough direction that we can bring back a final budget to your council for consideration and adoption on June 15th. So I would just add that if the direction is very consistent and very clear, you're all on the same page, a motion isn't necessary, but if there is a, a difference of opinion on any matter, then I think a motion would, would be warranted. Okay. And, and let me just ask, um, Kirsten, on every, since a lot of people brought up the library hours, which bucket would that fall under? The library hours are under the American Rescue Plan Act okay. bucket. Okay. So I got us up to that point. Yep. <laughs> All right. So um, why don't we, it's going to be hard though to delineate all right. Okay. Well, well, we'll do that. So getting us up to that point, let me, let's start uh, next with council member Haskew. And uh, why don't you take us all to that point on the revenues expenses and. Um, I, I'm, I'm fine with what council member Silva has gotten us to. I think I just duplicate it. Including the $200,000 investment. Yes. Okay. That, yes. That, that, that was what I said in discussion before. Okay. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Francois. So on the on the that particular item on the sustainability fund, I had understood that to be a one-time expenditure for fiscal year 22. And I guess I'd want to understand from staff, and I didn't think to ask this beforehand, but what, what other sources of funds would there be for that on an ongoing basis? Like on the homeless service fund, there's the CDBG grants, there's been COVID relief funds that we've been able to tap to backfill the homeless service fund. And I, I'm just not, I don't know. We would be committing then to 200,000 for sustainability on an ongoing basis. And it seems like we'd wanna know what other sources of funds there would be for that and what impact that has on the long-term financial forecast, or at least I would, to, to get comfortable with making that decision. I was looking to see if uh, we had Kara on the line. I'm not, I'm not seeing her here. You know, it depends on what what is in the plan and what might be eligible. And I see Mark Wardlaw is on. He might be able to help it. 
generally speaking, we would try to pursue grants where possible, whether it be through the state or other sources to help fund uh, some climate action activities. Depending on the type of plan we put in place, the actual strategies, there might be some types of fees that we would create or implement in order to help pay for something. I think those would be the, the primary sources that come to top of mind for me. And I would just add that, you know, the $200,000 is, is effectively a placeholder right now, as your council is aware, we'll hopefully be coming to your council later this summer, early fall with more definitive strategies. And once those are known, we can then better cost them out to get a, a sense of what we're really looking at on a basis. So 200,000 is intended to be a start and it would be refined over time. Yeah, one, one other question is what would the money be spent on? I don't think we really have a scope of work for that. I know that, you know, we don't have a, the plan yet. So uh, I know on in a looking forward, we're going to be converting our fleet from fossil fuel vehicles to electric and zero emission vehicles. That will happen as we turn over, as we turn over the cars, but, and we've retrofitted our buildings, but what, what exactly, you know, are we envisioning that this would be used for? It seems like we have a a pretty solid source for the homeless funds in terms of the Trinity Center and the overnight shelter. So I'm gonna to respond here while Mark's coming on. When we came up with the homeless services fund, there were no other funds really available. We were basically every year having to debate, how are we going to fund this? And how are we going to cobble it together? So this was, this is the same concept that you have the ability to say, at least for the next two years, that we envision that once the sustainability action plan is adopted, that there will be a, a mean, uh, there will be a need to, for these funds. And that this says we don't wanna wait, that we want to take, be ready to take action and not have to go then find a grant. So why 200 versus 100 or 400? I mean, if we don't know what the budget is that you're going to use the money for, it seems it's a placeholder. But it's it, a placeholder. It, it is subst it is more than 50 and less than 500. How's that? <laughs> you could probably spend 500,000 a year. I mean, these are a lot of times they're capital projects. They're infrastructure related. Whether it's you know changing out landscaping all across the city from you know very thirsty to drought tolerant to whatever else, EV charging stations. Um, so this is Mark Wardlaw. Um, that was our approach. So we um, will be coming to the council this year with the specific recommendations. And so we can anticipate um, developing the more detailed implementation programs after the council has provided direction on the adoption of the plan. And then we would also be um, costing out in greater detail the implementation items. And we will always be searching for the grant sources to implement the items. So the purpose, the reason we picked 200 was that represented a placeholder that would allow us to um, support uh, um, low low cost projects and continued staffing during the uh, this two year bu budget cycle, and then as we develop projects, we would come back as as allowed through the budget cycle. So it truly was a placeholder, and if if the placeholder amount is is too small, it's not actually useful. Um, but we also didn't want to overreach with you know an unknown. Um, and, and too large of a quantity at this point in time. So if it is truly just a placeholder, is there any downside to just addressing this as part of the capital budget every two years? When, you know, if we- No source of funds, it'll have to come from the general fund. Yes, and, and not all of the items are going to be capital. Some of them are going to be programmatic. Some of them will be um, promotional activities. Um, and, and so, you know, I think, you know, without the funding source, it makes it awkward to um, implement. Okay. I mean, one possibility is to just say, we don't know, but put in the 200 for FY 22 and 23, 
And then when we have this discussion for 24-25, we'll know what it is. We'll, so we don't have to redo our long-term financial forecast, but just say that like the core team, this is something that's gonna happen for two years. That was our concept, yes. And I, Cindy, I don't disagree with that, but I think we're about to have a debate on extra library hours and there's only a limited amount of money. Yes, and that's so I'm true. I'm worried about, wait, we're gonna take from this pod and put into that pod and I, I have some concerns with that. I, mean, I absolutely don't have any concerns with funding sustainability projects. I think we absolutely should do that. But this seems like a kind of an arbitrary way to do it to me. All the more reason that we should put it money aside. It is it is a statement that we are we are as a council agreeing that this is important enough to put what I call pat you on the popo and send you on your way money, because whatever we come up with sustainability is going to cost more than four hundred thousand dollars over the long haul. So this is this is a statement of commitment, and it also. Um, gives the people who are doing the project a real re a, a, a resource um, that when something amazing comes up, they have enough money to put together a grant and to put together a pilot program or something that might get attraction attractive for things. I don't think we should short sustainability just in I, I don't think we should short it. And the reality is we're talking about an extra 200,000 because we're really just talking about this two year budget cycle. And then the next two year budget cycle is a completely different discussion, could be a completely different discussion. Yes. And these aren't from the um, rescue plan monies. Mm -hmm. Okay. So any other further comments on this portion of it, Matt? I, I would be comfortable with with the and get to a comfort level on on the two hundred thousand for the two years of this budget cycle for sustainability. Okay. All right. And uh, Cindy Darling. Yeah, I, I'm comfortable with that. I mean, recognize it's a placeholder, but it's one of those things where if we put it in there, it represents our commitment to seeing this through, and you know the things that we will ultimately want to do for sustainability. Are, there are going to be some large capital projects and this it's always been useful to have the seed money to start people on those projects because then it's much easier to attract a grant program if you've got a 60% design plan and your seek was done and you're ready to go so I like having it in there and and we've done this before um, just talk to the Clark pool project on your parks or future so I and I agree I'll make it short I would agree with uh, what we've discussed to this point. Okay, Cindy, you want to take a stab at the next one? You're talking Cindy Silva? Yes, Councilmember Silva. I'm not licensed for the next one. It's has to be Cindy Silva. <laughs> You're not licensed? I'm not licensed to go there as the first talker. Well, I think the next part is the proposed parking fund budget. <laughs> you could have handled that one. <laughs> I think it's fine. I thought we were going ARPA. I could say the parking budget's fine. Okay, I'll, I'll say the parking budget's fine as well. Luella? And that's, yeah, and that's three, I'll make it four. Matt? Agreed. Okay, five for five. All right, wanna try to, wanna uh, council member Silva give ARPA a uh, shot here? Um, I divide them in all of these proposals into two categories. One are what I would call the one-time requests. They're truly backfilling or moving us forward. And that would be the um, $440,000, $450,000 in lost revenue, the um, air, fil air filtration system, the request from Walnut Creek downtown, um, with regard to the request, the economic development activities, I'm very concerned that there's nothing related to, to capital in there in order to, for this recovery project, I, whether it, 
whether it's a hundred or hundred and fifty thousand dollars, we I think it's something got lost in translation when they were adding all these things up. And particularly since the Locust Street redesign has been pushed out seven years, I think we should consider adding some one-time money in here. And I will also say that that conversation that Steve Waymeyer and uh, walked us through, we deferred six hundred to seven hundred thousand dollars in infrastructure work last year, roads, storm drains, and just regular maintenance money. And it doesn't just come back unless we reinvest it. And that that bothers me because it is one time costs that we have to somehow make up over time and we're not acknowledging it. And I will stop there because Matt's going to go, but no, it's, that means you want to use more. And yes, you're right. I, actually, I'm going to go here. I cannot support 52 hours. And my rationale is as follows. That is a long, that is going to be recurring year over year over year. And yet we do not have evidence that it's sustainable. Number two, we cut a lot of other things and that's the only thing we're bringing back. We cut maintenance staff, public works staff that we're now going to be not maintaining um, some parks the same way we have been and some roads the same way. And we're bringing back, this proposes to bring back library hours. All of our city, uh, the price has gone up to the point where we should be analyzing what we're getting so to make sure that we get the right thing for our community going forward, not assuming that the way we've done it in the past is the right thing for the future. Because as Luella said earlier, the way people use libraries are different. So I can support the 46 hours. I cannot support the 52 until we look at it more in more depth and see how things change over the next year when they do reopen. And um, I can support the crossing guards. Okay, and I can support the core. So there's ongoing and then there's one-time requests. So uh, I'll, I'll go next, uh, and I, I do support the, um, the crossing guard hours and, and everything else in here with the core, core homeless outreach and the air filtration improvements. I am a supporter of the library hours, and the reason is because more people than ever are going to be using the libraries. And it's, it's more than checking out books. As I've, have I seen for myself, and I think probably most of us have, there's so many more services that the libraries now offer. It's a place where uh, kids after school, and, and granted, we don't even know what school's gonna look like right now, but, but they are gonna be back in the fall. And certainly over the next couple of years are gonna be back and they use those libraries and there are different, and the, and the computers that are used. It's not just a matter of checking out and downloading books. The first thing that we said when we reduced the library hours last year is that as soon as we were able to and the, and the budget allowed for it, we would bring the library hours back. And of course, they, as we know, they were at 56 hours. And, and we're on record for that, uh, that that's the first thing we said we would bring back. And we were sorry to have lost them at the time. And now we've got the opportunity that through the ARPA funds, we can do that. I would actually support the, the getting back the 56 hours. I do agree a conversation has to happen regarding why is the Ignacio Valley branch, the same price as the Lafayette branch or the Walnut Creek branch for having open hours. That, that doesn't make sense based upon just the, the square footage size. And we should have that conversation. But in terms of having the library hours themselves, I would support, I would say for the, for the next year, because there is a little bit of uncertainty there, although we, we have heard that they're going to be opening, uh, 12 hours for the first year and 16 for the second. Uh, and at the very minimum, 12 for each, but I, we need to have these libraries open six days. I will not support us only having the libraries open for five days. But everything else on here, I would agree with. So, so you did respond to my what about the capital projects and that we have deferred. So we're, because I didn't hear you respond to that. On the capital projects, we, I would like to see that if we've got the money on the capital projects and it looked like we still did have money left because, and I'm not sure, can ARPA money be used for that or is that completely separate? 
It would depend on the type of the project or what the project was for. Because maybe some of those projects that could be using ARPA money. And I think I heard from Dan earlier that they're waiting for clarity on what the deadline is for encumbered allocated expended because you don't want to be doing a big capital project with ARPA funds and then lose it because you didn't finish your capital project in the time frame. Is that correct, Dan? Yeah, that is correct. As you can imagine, the the guidelines around ARPA are evolving. You know, we feel relatively confident with everything we're proposing. You know, that said, as more guidelines come out, we may have to come forward and propose some adjustments. Um, and as I, I think I saw Kirsten noting, I'm trying to scroll my screen here, that some capital projects may be eligible depending upon the the nature of the the project, but it's a little uncertain at this point, uh, but we might, you know, we might know as soon as a few weeks uh, or certainly within a couple months about uh, what we can and can't use it for definitively. But it is true that we, the ARPA funds are first and foremost, or one of the first and foremost reasons was to replace lost revenues. So when we lost gas tax dollars and we lost revenues that would have been contributed to the capital budget from the general fund, because the general fund lost revenue, isn't that an allowed use? Agreed, and I'm gonna risk going into too much detail, but way, the way they're structuring it is the revenue loss you have to demonstrate up to eight and a half, for in our, in our case, up to eight and a half million dollars of revenue loss has to be demonstrated so that we're eligible to receive the full eight and a half. And for example, if we only could demonstrate six million of loss, we would only be eligible for six and not the eight and a half. And then beyond that, there are new regulations about what it can be spent on after you qualify for the full amount. So we believe we qualify for the full eight and a half. And what we're still working through is what specifically can it be spent on? And certainly infrastructure is something that would seem to qualify with some caveats about specifically what it's used for. And that I don't have a clear answer, but certainly uh, we'd like to be able to spend it on capital projects or infrastructure as a qualifying expense. So we need to hear more more from that. And and what Luella had said regarding uh, the the cautionary tale of the library hours and and making and seeing how we're on a uh, an exact line budget that resonates with me. It really does. And and Luella brought up some great points. Uh, I still feel that the library hours are something that is a huge community benefit. We talk all the time to with developers about what are your community benefits going to be. The difference between five and six days of the library hours where they're closed on Saturdays and so therefore they're closed the entire weekend is huge. That's a huge community benefit. Maybe the biggest community benefit that Walnut Creek can possibly offer. So that's important to me. So I'll jump in next. I, um, I'm in general agreement with you, Kevin, about the library being open six days a week. I would I think the balance we tried to strike at the finance committee with the 12 extra hours is one I'm still comfortable with for the reasons I articulated earlier. And I'll also add, you know, if you look at this, this sheet, we're using two and a half million dollars of ARPA funds for a fiscal year 21 parking fund deficit. We have no idea what the parking fund's gonna look like in fiscal year 22. We haven't programmed any ARPA funds for that and we're, but we have agreed to use 100 parking meters for outdoor dining through at least the end of the year. So we know we're not getting that revenue. And I, and we just agreed to $200,000 for a sustainability fund for a second year. So I, I'm trying to balance all these different things. And to me, the, the 12 hours seems right. I absolutely agree with you. It has to be six days a week and that we committed to doing that as, as soon as we could. It does leave an opening still for the Library Foundation if they wanted to recapture those two extra hours on Wednesday and Thursday to be a partner going forward. They've already come up with some funds, but I think that this seems to me to strike the right balance, especially given that we're taking on the full core homeless outreach and, and the other items that are in here, even with something as minimal as crossing guards. Um, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be willing to have a conversation with those two schools about why I think it's necessary. If everybody, if the other 10 schools are doing 50-50, we really need them to do 50-50 as well. 
it needs to be fair across the board. I will support it in the budget here, but I, I, I do think that that everybody needs to do their fair share. And um, I just think we're trying to balance a lot of different things. And I, and we are so close to the margin that that 1.5 in extra ARPA funds could easily be swallowed up by a parking fund deficit. So I just, I'm not comfortable with going for the 16 on the library hours, but I, I am comfortable with the 12 extra hours. Um, let's go to council member Darling. Um, I've been struggling with this one as you all have, obviously. Um, I can see the library as so much more than just a place to go get books, especially in these days. Um, so I do want to make sure that we have it open on a Saturday. So I can support the 12 hours. Um, I wish we had more flexibility. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Let's, let's, let, let's let Cindy. Somehow we got into Saturday being in question. Saturday's standard at 40 hours. This is a question of Monday. So before we, when we're opining with the wrong point okay. of view, it's Monday. Six days a week. Let's put that. Six days a week. Um, I, so I am comfortable with the 12 hours. I wish we had more flexibility to do um, something in a hybrid mode. But if we're locked into 12 or 16, I'm comfortable with 12. I'm comfortable with core um, on the crossing guards. I would like to see if we could put a guilt on the schools that are not able to fundraise. Um, and I would like to make sure we at least hold something like the 1.5 out there because for economic recovery, there's a lot of things that we still are working on that are going to cost money. And I don't wanna spend everything now. I wanna make sure we have money left over. Okay, and and I think it was my mistake. I brought up Saturday. It, it should have been Monday as the as that sixth day, um, but I think that the the general idea of six days is what we um, what we were discussing. The uh, one thing we hadn't actually talked about, which is still up in the air because it has to go through the rebound committee and all, is if restaurants that are using the outdoor space will be paying anything fees for using those outdoor spaces where meters are. And that's still to be determined, but it sounded like at one of our previous meetings, that was the general direction that council would like to see it go. So there is that that hasn't even been accounted for yet. Um, all right, so it, it sounds like we're in agreement on your- I didn't say anything. I'm sorry? You never called on Luella. Oh, I'm sorry. And I'm probably on your screen this you're not time. On my, you're not on my screen. You're on my second sheet. I, I apologize for that, Luella. I, I, I'm going to I'm going to stop by your house and I'm going to show you how to get me on your screen. Um, <laughs> anyhow, um, the, the I, Matt made the most salient point I think, um, and that is that we're talking about we're talking about such a narrow margin of. Of, of correctness that that to argue um, to to put this in or that I actually think from my my conversations back in 2020 with parents at, at various at the schools who were saying that none of the schools can afford the the crossing guards and that their fundraising has dried up and the energy for the people to raise the funds has dried up. So if we believe that we're supporting crossing guards, which I equate to children's lives as opposed to people going, going in and, and having a lecture, I think that there are, you know, we need, to, we need to remember how thin a line we're walking on all of this. And if we lose too many people in our staff and we can't get them um, because they just, are too overworked, um, or something happens, and our parks don't get our parks don't get worked on. Um, we're going to have to go find a way to get those done. We are operating on a narrow, narrow margin, and and to and to to just say, okay, well, our library 
is so important that we are willing to put everything in Walnut Creek at risk is wrong. Um, uh, in my heart, I want to say we should do the 46 hours and, and um, but I will go with what I know is hat count as the, as the approved three and I'll, I'll tell, I'll say that Matt guilted me back into the 12 hours. Um, but I, I am not convinced that's the right answer. So I agree with not doing a lot of do it, Cindy's statement, Cindy Silva's statement, but I only agree with the 12 hours of the library. And I do that with fear and trepidation. Um, under, understood. And I appreciate the, the caution expressed by the CPA of the group. Um, all right. So it, it seems that we're in pretty much consensus with everything except the library hours specifically. And if, uh, why don't we just take a quick reading of this where I, I had wanted to see 16 hours. I will, uh, I will certainly agree on the compromise to 12 hours. Um, if, if I can see a, a quick show of hands, if you're for the 12 hours, or if you're not for the 12 hours, we'll put it that way. So that could mean either zero, six, or 16, uh, if you are not. And then we'll go at that point. I just want to see if, if we have a consensus for 12 hours among the other three or four. So put your hand up if you're for 12. OK. All right. So we can take a vote on this. Or what can we do, Cindy and Luella, to, to come to consensus on this? I'm just going to vote no on that one piece of it. And I'm okay with that. And all of you should be okay with that too. Okay. Because I believe there are enough flaws in what have been given to us in the pricing that we should be, and I believe that the usage, we should be analyzing it. I've already st stated my point and um, I understand, but I think we're leaving a lot of other things. We're deferring a lot of other things at the same time that we don't even understand. Okay. So for this piece, for the ARPA budget, and I will, um, I'll make the, the motion then on that since we'll need that. Uh, I move to approve the ARPA budget as staff and the finance committee recommended. And um, that's my motion. Second. And uh, Susie, would you take the roll please? Mayor Wilk. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Francois. Aye. Councilmember Darling. Aye. Councilmember Haskew. No. Councilmember Silva. No. Motion carries three to two. Okay. Um, that is there anything more in the budget, or did we cover what's needed? I believe everything has been covered. So the the only the change or 200,000 in for the second year. That would be the only change that I have noted that uh, we would make to what has been proposed. That is correct. Okay. To, I move to uh, recommend the general fund budget as presented with the addition of the $200,000 in the second year of the budget for the sustainability action plan. Second. Motion and a second. Um, Councilmember Silva? Aye. Councilmember Haskew? Aye. Councilmember Darling? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Francois? Aye. Mayor Wilk? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Okay. I normally would take a break right now before the next item. However, uh, we'll be taking a break anyway in about five minutes. So, uh, so bear with me here. Uh, the next item on the agenda is, oh, I lost my place here. Next item on the agenda is the um, appointment or the interview process for uh, our for two positions on our commissions. And so we have been sent ballots and we've already received all of the people that have applied. 
And what we're going to do on the ballots is the, the discussion I'd like to quickly have is how many of the, uh, how many people would we like to see for interviews? And that's the amount of people that we will vote for on ballot one. So I recommend that we create a short list to interview by that. And um, my recommendation, I'll put that out there first, is for four. And what, I'm sorry, Cindy, what was that? You just put your- Well, I was gonna say four for pros at, the, at a minimum, but three or four for the other. Okay, so, um, right. So I actually, and I was gonna say four for pros and, and I'm okay if we do three or, or four for the advisory council on aging. So let me ask uh, Mayor Pro Tem Francois. Do you have a preference? I'm fine with that proposal. Okay. And Council Member Hassan? Same. Cindy, darling? So are we doing four for pros and three? Oh. Just to make it easy, why don't we do four for each? How about that? Four for each? Okay. So here's what we'll do. On, on the ballot, put, oh, that doesn't come out very well. Just put on your ballot one, X on four places for each. And then um, let's send them, to, if everybody has Susie's cell phone, is that how you prefer to get it, Susie? Email or cell phone, yes. Okay, so yes, either email or text Susie uh, in the next five minutes. And in the meantime, since you'll have to tabulate everything and give us the final four, why don't we reconvene in 10 minutes? Do you wanna take public comment before? The ballot. Oh, you're right. Oh, sorry about that. Um, it's late. Why don't we take public comment if we have anybody that would like to speak on this? Please raise your hand now. Okay. No, I'm not seeing any speakers. Okay. I apologize for missing that important piece. How many is it for the four? Council? Four, four for each. So text. So. Mark your ballots for the four you would like for each. Text or email to Susie. It's now 9.33. We will reconvene at 9.43. And uh, the city clerk will read who those four interviewees will be.
All right, we're back after that short recess. And again, this is recruitment for the uh, unscheduled vacancies on the Park Recreation Open Space Commission and for representative on the Advisory Council on Aging. So we've all sent in our ballots and do we have a, uh, a top four to be interviewed then, Susie, for each? Um, yes, yeah, so I'll go ahead and start with the Advisory Council on Aging and I'll um, report out on the votes first. Uh, we have Council Member Silva voting for Sue Ad Eric Freetag, Lisa Guadagna, and Dale Harrington. Council Member Haskew voting for Sue Adams, Eric Freetag, Lisa Guadagna, and Leo Sang. Council Member Darling voting for Mike Awadal and Eric Freetag. I'll note she voted for two. And then Council uh, Mayor Pro Tem Francois voted for Sue Adams, Eric Freetag, Dale Harrington, and Brian O'Toole, and Mayor Wilk voting for Sue Adams, Eric Freetag, Dale Harrington, and Leo Sang. So this resulted in four in five votes for Eric Freetag, four votes for Sue Adams, three votes for Dale Harrington, two votes for Lisa Guadagna and Leo Sang, and one vote each for Mike Awadal and Brian O'Toole. Okay, so again, we had one for five, two, two with four. One with five, one with four, one with three, two with two, and two with one. I would suggest we interview three. Okay. So that would be Eric Freetag, Sue Adams, and Dale Harrington. And I'll make that motion. I'll second. And. Okay, we have uh, Council Member Silva. Mayor Wilk? Aye. Councilmember Darling? Aye. Councilmember Haskew? And Mayor Pro Tem Francois? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. And then moving on to the Park Recreation and Open Space Commission, Councilmember Darling voted for Fran Garland. Um, she, um, Councilmember Haskew voted for Chris Hunter. Yotam Levine, Ian McLaughlin, and Charles Tollerton. Council Member Silva voted for Fran Garland, Chris Hunter, Ian McLaughlin, and Charles Tollerton. Um, Mayor Pro Tem Francois voted for Fran Garland, Chris Hunter, Ted Clobber, Ken Knox, and Mayor Wilk voted for Fran Garland, Fran Garland, Chris Hunter, Ken Knox, and Ian McLaughlin. Um, this resulted in four votes for Fran Garland, four votes for Chris Hunter, three votes for Ian McLaughlin, and then the others received either one, two, or no votes. Move to interview Fran Garland, Chris Hunter, and Ian McLaughlin. Second that. Council Member Silva? Aye. Council Member Darling? Aye. Council Member Haskew? Mayor Pro Tem Francois. Aye. And Mayor Wilk. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. All right. And, and you'll let them know in the next couple of days, Susie? Yes. And I'm assuming we want to move forward with interviewing the three applicants all at once versus yes. individual. OK. Yes. Yes. I will notify the applicants tomorrow morning. Thank you. All right. I believe this takes us to the end of our regular meeting uh, and the Walnut Creek City Council is now adjourned. Thank you all. It's been a long meeting, especially for those members on the council and staff that have been around almost six hours. So have a good evening. Thanks everyone for attending. Good night.